Turns off or on the silent interferes with the recording equipment. Um, can I also just draw the attention uh, to the committee, the bursary student um, today is the last day that uh, Alan McDade will be working with the committee uh, as this year's bursary programme comes to an end. So I think just to put on the record, we want to thank Anna for her work uh, at the committee of the last uh, eight months and wish her well for her dissertation and for the future. Uh, agenda item one, uh, members, is apologies. I haven't received any formal apologies. Chris. Uh, Chris Hazard, OK. Any other apologies? No? OK, agenda item two, then, is a draft minute held on the... 21st of May, you'll find those at pages 5 through to 9 of your folders. If you want to just glance over those and indicate you're happy enough, I'll sign off on them. Are we happy enough? Yep. Okay. There you go. Agenda item 3, matters arising. First item uh, is on the back of Sir Keir Starmer's report. Um, the attendance of the Director of Public Prosecution has discussed the findings and recommendations of the independent review by Keir, uh, by Keir Starmer. Uh, will be on the 11th of June. We have some question mark. Well, we'll get the DPP up. 11th of June uh, is the date. Uh, the PPS has also indicated the report by the Attorney General in relation to the handling of the Adams case should be available by the end of this week uh, or by Tuesday at the latest. So. Uh, Again, that's just for noting. Uh, item two, legal aid dispute. Uh, members will be aware the Bar Council has now withdrawn its services uh, as a result of the Crown Court legal aid remission rates. Uh, the committee previously has written to the Minister regarding the legal action being taken against them, the likely short-term and longer-term impact of withdrawal of services and what action the Department is taking in light of these developments. So again, uh, it's just really for noting. We've on then to agenda item four. Just to remind the committee that following the oral briefing from the department on the 4th of March on the current position on the range of firearms issues, the Deer Society and the British Association for Shooting and Conservation, the Gun Trade Guild in Northern Ireland and Countryside Alliance Ireland requested an opportunity to brief the committee on those proposals and the relevant papers you can find in your meeting folders, pages 11 through to 79. Uh, arrangements will be made for representatives of the organisations to attend today's meeting, with the briefing by the Deer Society taking first, taking place first, followed by a combined briefing with BASC, the Gun Trade Guild and uh, Countryside Alliance. So um, I think Dave McCulloch is first up, so we are ready. Dave is a representative of the Northern Ireland Deer Society. So, Dave, just whenever you're ready, just to, to, so you note that uh, we're recording the uh, the meeting and it'll appear on, on the committee website in due course. So, mm -hmm. in your you. own time, if you want to, to brief us on the issues, and then we'll open up to uh, the members for questions. So, okay, thank you. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks for the invitation to uh, come and address the the, the committee. Uh, the Northern Ireland Deer Society, known just locally as NIDS, is a deer welfare group. And while some of our members are deer stalkers, our society does not involve itself in any form of lethal deer control or deer management. We concentrate on disseminating knowledge of deer and their ecology through public events and arranging outings and locations where deer may be observed and photographed. The society's membership is family-based, and the membership averages around 25 to 30 families. We expect to amalgamate with the Irish Deer Society after this year's AGM. The IDS membership is close to 200 families. The amalgamation is aimed at the creation of an island-wide approach to deer welfare in Ireland. And uh, so we are consultees to a number of government departments here, including Forestry Service, Guard, the Food Standards Agency, the PSNI, and the uh, Department of Justice. We provide advice and assistance on deer related issues to councils, police, and to research students following deer related projects, and information and comment to the general public and the media. We, uh, we are, our main purpose is, we is to challenge any legislative changes proposed by government uh, and their departments or any ac actions by any other body where we feel that deer welfare is, uh, will be adversely affected. Now, just to get to the business, in my letter to Mr Ross, I dealt with three topics. Uh, the first was the proposed banding system. Number two, the extension of the proposal to introduce an age reduction for young shooters to 12 years of age for clay target shooting and to the shooting of live quarry under supervision at age 16. And finally, the need for fully accredited firearms training and assessment as a prerequisite to the granting of firearms certificates. Turning first to the banding system, NIDS believes that the most recent proposals for banding of firearms are reasonable as the bands are based on matching the grouped calibres to quarry size to give the best chance of a clean kill. We consider that the five-day turnaround indicated by licensing branch for variation applications for farms which fall outside the banding system would not represent a significant inconvenience to farms holders. The Society believes that this timescale will only be achievable if there are sufficient resources available to farms licensing. 
We believe that the undertaking, uh, the undertaking by the Minister to keep the banding system under review is a reasonable and measured way forward. It offers increased convenience to farms holders and will allow confidence to be established in the delegation of farms licence variation handling within the bands to dealers. So we will now turn to the, to the, uh, the question of, of, of uh, young shooters. Uh, the shooting organisations are proposing that a minimum age for hunting with farms should be reduced to 12 years in line with the proposal for use of farms for clay, uh, clay target shooting. Our concerns are primarily focused on the physical ability of a young person of 12 years to safely handle firearms continuously in an open ground hunting situation. The average double barrel gun can be in excess of 3 kilos and can be over a metre uh, in overall length. This would be heavy, unwieldy and fatiguing to the majority of 12-year-olds if they were having to carry a shotgun over ground over such ground for any length of time. If a child is carrying a shotgun, it would tend to make the recovery from a stumble more difficult, and this has to increase the chances of a fall and possibly an inadvertent discharge, particularly if safety drills uh, have been overlooked. This may result in injury to the child or others present. In open ground, we believe it is not possible to provide the same level of supervision and safety as would be the case in the clay pigeon shooting environment where the trainer stroke supervisor can be primarily focused on the shooter's firearm handling and safety skills. The young person also has the added security of shooting within a cage which physically constrains the arc of fire. In the hunting field, the supervisor may also be carrying his or her own gun and be looking out for a quarry and obstacles resulting in them not being able to give their whole attention to their charge or to react immediately to prevent an accident. NIDS accepts the argument that the need for muzzle awareness, use of safety catch and constant attention to safety drills can be most effectively learned in a closely supervised and controlled environment of a clay or target shot over a reasonable period of participation. The safety oriented behaviours learned are likely to be embedded in the muscle memory and become automatic before progressing to hunting over open ground. I included in my letter to the Chairman two examples of shooting incidents involving young people with sporting firearms both of which had adult supervision, and one of which incidents had tragic consequences. This was to illustrate our point that supervision alone cannot guarantee safety. Uh, so we'll touch on supervision in more detail uh, when I deal with this view on farms training just a little later. Uh, returning to the latest proposal for the minimum age in which young people may engage in hunting of live quarry with farms is now 16 years of age, and NIDS supports this proposal and holds that very few children under 16, and particularly at the age of 12, would be expected to have the psychological maturity to appreciate the gravity of taking a life, albeit that of an animal or a bird, and if encouraged to do so early in their psychological development, they may not acquire the respect for the quarry which we believe so important in the responsible hunter. It may also be the case that a child is placed in a situation where they feel under pressure from an adult and obliged to kill when it is not their natural inclination to do so at this early stage in their lives. The society considers that age 16, at age 16 a young person would be much more likely to have the maturity to a, decide that they actually want to engage in hunting and b, to be more physically capable of safe gun handling over rough ground and particularly much safer if they have been well schooled in their safety drills in the clay target shooting clubs uh, environment. It recognises that DOJ has employed risk assessment and has considered the safety of the young shooter and bystanders in its approach to the, the age changes proposed for clay shooting and the live, and live quarry shooting. We will now sort of move on now to training and supervision. Um, the Working Environment Health and Safety Executive uh, operate on the principle that employees must be both trained and assessed as competent in the safe use of their equipment before being allowed to operate that equipment. <coughs> it makes sense to us that the use of firearms should be treated no less seriously. NIDS accepts that accidents for farms in, in, in NI are, 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 are thankfully rare, but it believes that it is an unjustified leap of faith to assume that the supervision of an untrained novice shooter by another experienced, in inverted commas, but not formally trained shooter can be relied upon to prevent farm-related incidents. The length of time a certificate has been held is not a reliable measure of a person's ability to adequately train and supervise a novice, in our view. Following on from, uh, from, the, from the industrial health and safety reference, in the farming environment, youngsters uh, as young as 13 are permitted to drive tractors under supervision, but only having successfully completed a basic tra training, a training course and competency test. NIDS believes that there is a danger of passing on bad habits and poor farm handling techniques uh, to the novice if the supervisor has not him or herself been formally trained in safe farm handling and use. 
our society believes that formal, standard and nationally accredited training and assessment in the use of each type of farm applied for should be a central pillar of our farms legislation, as it is in the vast majority of other European countries. Only the UK, Bulgaria and Slovakia out of 26 years do not require formal training uh, to acquire a far farms licence. We believe it is the only way to ensure that every individual taking up the sport of shooting and hunting at the very least receives a sound standard grounding in farm safety and farms handling, which they can build on throughout their supervision period. Formal training for deer stalkers is now a de facto requirement for anyone applying for a rifle to hunt deer. This training and qualification, Deer Stalking Level 1, was instigated and is currently promoted and marketed by the BASC and the British Deer Society. We believe it is a glaring anomaly that licences for equally lethal high-velocity fox calibre rifles are currently granted without any training or assessment requirement. Liz believes that public safety in relation to firearms licensing would be better assured um, but by, pardon me, <coughs> um, by requiring all new applicants to undergo standardised and nationally accredited firearm safety training and assessment as a prerequisite to the granting of a firearm certificate. Such training and assessment in farm safety, and in most cases additional training and examination for hunters in the ecology of the target species, humane dispatch of wounded animals and the safe hunting techniques is the norm in all but a few European states. Finally, I would like to, I would like to mention uh, third party insurance. And uh, th th this is for, for shooting and hunting activity. But shooting accidents, again, as I've said, are, are, are rare in Northern Ireland. We believe that, that, uh, that all those who participate in shooting sports should be required by law to hold third party insurance cover for their sporting activities to provide adequate support for anyone who is affected by a shooting accident. <coughs> Very many uh, responsible NI shooters are members of BSE, Countryside Alliance, Scottish Association for Country Sports, and the Target Shooting Clubs and Associations. And they're all covered by insurance provided by, the, by, the, by their membership. Independent insurance is also available without joining the organisations, but those who are members of these organisations have the benefit of safety information and training uh, literature available from those organisations. It is a legal responsibility to have third-party third party car insurance for reasons that can also be applied to owners, ownership and use. So, to conclude, NIDS considers the consultation <coughs> process to be an open, objective, focused and fair. The issues raised have been uh, at times complex and frustrating. The shooting organisations and the gun trade bodies' representations in the areas of fees and dealer security has been very important to the consultation, of great benefit to the members, and has resulted in clarification and amendment of the calculation of fees and some serious rethinking by the Department of uh, Justice and Farms Licensing. The Department of Justice and Farms Licensing has, on every occasion that I am aware of, taken consultees' views on board and allocated extra time and effort where necessary to consider and test those views, and they have used the outcomes to inform their recommendations to the Minister. NIS is satisfied that the current proposals for licence fees for individual farms holders reflect an accurate cost for processing and, and and the proposed age reductions for participa participation in clay target shooting and hunting of live quarry are reasonable. We are also happy with the proposed banding system as it contributes <coughs> to ensuring the humane dispatch of appropriate quarry. We support the gun trades bodies in their continued effort to agreement on security arrangements that are proportionate and practical for the smaller dealers and gun repairers. We support the shooting organisations in their provision of training, education and insurance for their membership and congratulate them on their effective and detailed contribution to the consultation and licence fees. And finally, to close, uh, NIDS would urge the Committee, the Department of Justice, the PSNI and Farms Licensing to put compulsory farm safety training and third party insurance onto their agendas for consultation and consideration in, in the near future. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, very much. I have a couple of questions for open up to, to other members. You mentioned um, the issue about the, the young shooters, and I think we will all accept that, that young people mature psychologically and, and physically at different rates. And I suppose if you're talking about some sort of training procedure that, that gets around the age, the, the age isn't relevant to whether the young person is able to, to handle a gun and, and act responsibly. In terms of your, your mandatory training, who do you envisage doing that and, and, and what would the cost be or who would bear the cost of that? Well, the, obviously the, uh, the BSC and BDS already deliver training. Um, for, for deer stalking. Uh, in other European countries, uh, this training is generally delivered by national um, hunting associations and federations. But obviously, that they say that I mean, it's, it's a question of you know the <coughs> shooting organisations who provide it. Um, I would suggest that they, they could they could build on that. I mean, they're already doing it, and they're in the business of delivering training and excellent training. I must say, having uh, well, actually gone through the, uh, the deer stalking training myself. 
and uh, I would say to if, if all other if, if that was exp expanded out to the other other areas of hunting and shooting, then uh, I mean I would certainly be, I'd be a lot happier and a lot more confident that uh, that accidents would be prevented through that training. So, so but in terms, in terms of cost, well, I mean the cost yeah. for the deer stalking, of course, I think it's about, it's about uh, somewhere around about two hundred and fifty pounds. It's a while since I've done it. I'm not sure what the current price is, but you know it's um, it's it's a, it's a question of cost against risk. You know, so I think that, you know, that if, there's, if there's a cost in it, then so be it. Um, the, the, the duty of care is, is to ensure public safety, <coughs> and uh, I believe that can only really be done effectively through adequate, uh, you know, nationally accredited training. And do you have any idea how many people voluntarily go through that training now? Well, I, th I think it's. Well, I mean, I can only only tell, uh, sp speak from, uh, from from reading the shooting magazines, but I, I think that the BSC and and British Deer Stalking are regularly putting. You know, maybe you know, 20 or 30 people through um, at least you know per year, but I think, but it, but it, it's it, it's important to remember that you cannot. I mean, farms licensing, well, licensing, as far as I'm aware, will not not award you a license for for a, a hunting rifle unless you actually have that qualification. So it's already there, and it's, it's, it may be de facto. You know, I'm not sure if it if it's completely required on, under the act, but it's certainly there is a de facto requirement. And just funny, you, you mentioned the. Um other European countries have a model that you seem to support? A particular model? Yeah, is, I'm, going to, I'm going to ask you, is there a particular model elsewhere in Europe that you think is a model that we should follow? Well, I think the, 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 German, one, uh, the German model is, 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 I think, is reckoned to be the most detailed, but also it, 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 that, that, in fact, is, is, is very expensive and can, can take a long time. Now, I believe that you know, the courses that are delivered by, you know, by uh, uh, deer management qualifications, who are a company formed, I think, by BSC and uh, and then the British Sears Society, I mean, they, they, they do it, I think, at a very reasonable cost and uh, in, a, in what I reckon is a, real, a realistic time to um, get that training across and have it absorbed. I think some of these companies, well, you're talking about maybe a year, a year to complete training. Mm. I, 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 so I, I, don't, I don't think that's totally necessary. Okay, okay Simon? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for your presentation so far. Um, you mentioned your concerns about young shooters. In Northern Ireland, um, have you any idea how many young people we're talking about that that age bracket? Well, well to be quite honest, I haven't. You know, but I, I'm a member of, of a number of shooting clubs and shooting organisations, and to be quite frank with you, know, I mean, we, we don't actually see that many young people actually you know, uh, coming through. It's generally teenagers that are that are coming through, and and, and they, they would generally be tend to be about maybe 16 or above. In terms of the, the average age of shooters right across Northern Ireland, have you any idea what the average age would be? I would say the, I would say the average age would tend to be I mean, a, a, a middle age, I, I, I would imagine. And in relation to the concerns about young shooters, um, what's the experience in other parts of the United Kingdom? Would you have any idea? In terms of? Of young shooters, just um, I mean, you mentioned. Well, well, I think I mean obviously that uh, I know that uh, that uh, some of the shooting organisations they, they have young shots days, but we would certainly are very are, 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 from reports that they, you know, the children have, have a wonderful time, and, and and I believe they are they are quite popular and sometimes oversubscribed. And you mentioned I think two examples of some accidents that have yes. occurred here. Uh, again, would you have any idea um, what's the situation in other parts of the United Kingdom in terms of young people? Well, I mean, there's, well, there's, well, obviously there have been accidents, but I think it was it was actually mentioned by the Department of Justice that they that, that they're meeting that you know they, they they weren't able to obtain accurate figures for that. But I think, but I I'm, I'm but I, my drive is basically is from risk. You know, as I know, they can say that yes, these things don't happen very often, but once it's too it's just too it's too often, and we really want my my driver and, and the driver of our organisation is really is to reduce that that risk to as low as it could possibly be. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, Patsy. Yes, thanks very much, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's, there's a number of things um, arising from it. Um, first, um, just as they come up, f sorry, first, Chair, um, we were promised way back in March of details of CIFAX from the uh, departmental officials. I don't recall that that has arrived. There seemed to be some wee bit of uh, willingness around some of the responses we were getting anyway, so I hope maybe Post isn't as willing. Um, about that. Um, just secondly, thank you very much for your presentation. And, but there's some of it just doesn't square with me. And I hear, I'm glad to hear that you actually have knowledge of firearms. Um, I learned from my uncle the use of, of firearms, the use of shotguns. He learned from his father, who was a soldier. So I'm hoping that you're not presuming that the training I would have got uh, was deficient or something like that. And 
that um, that would be the case because um, we learned very stringently the use, the use of a shotgun in particular. Well, we could just say to you, so no, no, not yes. in the least. And right. I'm not saying that I'm not saying that 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 that, that, you know, that there's no uh, shooter would be capable of active of supervising and yes. training something because they obviously your your training come down from military training. No, well, no, maybe so, there's a bit of that there yeah, too. No, but so, but but what I what I'm trying right. to guarantee is that. But that everybody gets a standardised foundation in farm yes. safety, you know, standardised, and then you can guarantee, you can quality assure it. And well, uh, that uh, way, it, it kind of uh, normalises the uh, situation. I'm actually thinking of other situations where people go to clay pigeon shoots yes. and they learn very good practice there. If they don't, they're away. Mm -hmm. And that brings me on to I don't know what sort of a shoot that example too that you gave there. Was that one that you were involved in yourself? Uh, that was the one. Yes, uh, that, that was the local uh, one. Yes, that, that, was that, that, that example actually concerns me. Yes. That a second and indeed a third chance was given to that guy to flick a safety and to be pointing yeah. the gun round at people. So yeah, well, maybe, I wasn't in charge. Maybe whoever was in charge of the supervision there should have been drawn to their attention, get rid of that boy because yeah. he's danger. Yeah, I would agree. And then whenever the thing goes off, because that's not proper supervision in my book. No. Um, but just a few of the practicalities you referred there to young people having maybe difficulty carrying firearms and stuff. Have you ever seen a 410 single barrel shotgun? Yes, I have. You know what weight it is then? Yes. So, but you, but you can't, you well, can't, you can't guarantee that, 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 that if, if we say this, this is okay for twelve years, or you uh, uh, say the legislation would restrict the weight and, and the type of uh, shot. I appreciate that, use. but you use the generalism there. I'm sorry, but I have to get through the practicalities of it. Um, then you, you refer then, and I, I just and I'll, I'll leave it at this. You referred then to specific concerns in relation to deer welfare and how potentially, I think maybe you made the reference to how they might be adversely affected. Can you give me some examples as to what you mean by that? Yes, um, the, 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 we were involved recently with a, a company who were, we were starting up a, a venison marketing company, right. and it was mm -hmm. the market uh, the market venison. Mm -hmm. But they were they were they were insisting on on head and neck shots. Yes, and uh, and I say that I mean as far as we are concerned, it's not best practice for start. To do that routinely, and there's there, there's a high there's a high likelihood of of, 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 of maybe of, of shooting a deer through its lower jaw, it dies of starvation, or shooting it through the windpipe, and it dies of infection. Sorry, this is the, to get back there. That was for a commercial operation, was it? That was for a commercial operation. Yes. yes. So so so, so, that, so we, we saw that that was a, 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 a deer welfare issue. So we we, we lobbied against that. Unsuccessful. You lobbied against uh, against you know, the, the, you know, the use of head and neck shots to cull to cull the deer. Those are they were saying they're quality assured. Therefore, they they, they don't. You, you lobbied against the head and neck shots. Yes, we did indeed. Why, if the commercial organisation they they just dealing with the commercial aspect? Yes. For insisting they didn't want body shots. Well, they, they were they, they were talking about meat wastage. Oh, but sorry, I'm, I'm kind of losing the run of this one or losing the, the trust of it. You, you referred there to. Commercial organisation <coughs> and their requirement for head and neck—that's understandable. But then you went on to say that if they're not properly shot in the head or neck, that could lead to inhumane conditions. No, no. What I'm saying is that in taking a head or neck shot at, a, at, at any distance, say over 100 metres, in fact, even less than even over 60 metres, there's always the likelihood of that bullet not hitting the actual point that you're aiming at. If you're aiming at the head, you're aiming at a brain, you're aiming at a small target. If you're aiming at the neck, again, the neck, the neck can be quite thick. And you know, if you aim at the middle, you're more likely to go through the, the windpipe than go through the actual spinal cord. So the best practice uh, in, in both in, in, in Scotland and, and, <coughs> and, and now England, the, the best practice is, is a heart and lung shot. And that, that has a much bigger target, and you're more likely, it's more likely to, to uh, actually dispatch the deer without, w w without the risk of wounding it. Sorry, but, but as you start from the point of the commercial interest, is yes. that? But we're obviously all looking for humane dispatch. Oh yes, animals. yes. So, well, oh, no, that, that's okay. Yeah. Just want to clarify that matter. Um, Chair, that's fine. Thank you. And thank you. Hey, thank you. Hi. That's it, <coughs> I'm just in terms of what do you think the age should be? I, no, I, I think I think you no know, 16 is a reasonable age. Um, no, to, 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 to start young people hunting. And, and in terms of the training, how would you standardise the training? Well, again, I said the, 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 I would refer back to the, you know, to the training provided by, by the, the, uh, the Deer Management Qualifications Company. I, mean, I believe that, that that's an excellent training course, very professionally presented, very professionally run and, 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 and stringently assessed. You know, so I mean, I, I mean, any, any training on farms in any, any area I think could, in terms of hunting, 
could easily be based, uh, be based on that. That course could be adopted for any quarry. Uh, and in terms of the age limit, uh, would, uh, do you foresee at 16 any exemption, room for exemption? Well, I, well, I think there already is. There, there, I think there's, well, I think there's, uh, I say I'm not totally clear, but I think there is some exemption for, you know, for, for, uh, for farmers' sons, but I think that the age is 16 already. <coughs> You know, so but I mean, you say ex exemptions. Uh, I mean, I'm not, not too clear on just where you're going with that. Well, I mean, the chair talked about maturity or a club, a better organised club, somewhere where <clears throat> some of the conditions you talk about, people have been on their own and yeah. Oh, oh sorry, I sorry, say yes. it was a more closed yes. condition. Well, no, I would say that. I mean, at, at 16, I would say that 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 that, 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 that would uh, which they could start shooting at 16. But I think well, a, a period of supervision obviously is very sensible. That's what I said. That if you start off from the basis of a formal standardised uh, training that everybody gets, that's the, those that that's plain, well thought out and covers every aspect of it. Then I still would see that there would still be a requirement for supervision by you no know, by an experienced shooter, but at least the person being the, the novice now has he now has the basics for safety, <coughs> and he can build he can build on, on that on that through uh, being supervised by uh, by an experienced shot for whatever period of time. I think a year or twelve months has been mentioned. Uh, before, and, and then, and then <coughs> they'd be allowed then to, to go off and hunt on their own on, on their own account. If there were, uh, would there be an exemption? Say, if you're on a confined and, and defined you know, space, say like a shooting club as a, a particular space. Well, no, sorry, I, I'm talking specifically now about about about, about hunting. Yeah. No, hunting live yeah. quarry. Yeah. I, sorry, are you talking about something? So well, some shooting shoot on their own farmland. Until they, they they hold the firearm, maybe in controlled circumstances. Oh no! Well, well I, mean, I would think that at, at 16, I mean, most. I mean, not everybody, because it says as, as the chairman actually alluded to. You know, all children develop at different rates, and really, what we're trying to do is basically is, is, is come to what would be a reasonable, or, or a reasonable starting point. And just to clarify, the 16 is for quarry only, not for clay pigeon shooting. Well, no, 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 no. So, no, As far as I'm concerned, I think no, the 12 is fine because they're, they're, they're going to be operating in very controlled conditions. They're going to be shooting from within a cage. They have an instructor supervisor beside them, and obviously they're, they're not going to be walking around really with, 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 with a shotgun. You know, so uh, I think that no, 12 is reasonable in, in, in that environment. Sorry, I'm sorry for that. That's lovely. That's, that's great. Chair, thank you. Okay, Paul. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation, uh, David, and, and uh, your information. Uh, with regards to the band system, I take it from your, what you said, you're in support of a band system. But do you have an example of a band system that you would want or prefer? No, I'd say a bit of a lot of, I mean, our, our, our um, angle on the, on the banded system is basically that you know, it's the welfare of the quarry. And that banded system, now we're told uh, you know, by the, the uh, PSNI farms expert, is based on uh, calibre and muzzle energy being matched to the quarry size, small and medium quarry. And, and basically, so, that, 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 so that's been looked at, and somebody's decided that those calibres are, are, are the most suitable carry for that, the calibre of that size of, of, of quarry to guarantee a humane kill. And uh, that, 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 that's, that's basically why, why, why we support it. I say the, uh, the, the, I mean, as far as the, um, it's just a general comment from us, really, and that it's, it is really, it's, it's um, delegating responsibility for farms variation applications within the bands being delegated to the dealers. And I think I think that's a benefit to uh, farms holders because it's going to be more convenient for them. And really, what I'm, what I'm saying is that you know the, the, the minister, I guess, has, has proposed that yes, we will go forward with with that proposal and keep it under review. Right, but as I've said, I think that's a, that's a measured approach, and it gives it gives time really for confidence to be built up uh, in this delegation of of, of, of authority you know, to the dealers. And uh, and uh, it seems to me that if it's left open for review, that could be extended. And I think that, as far as the shooting fraternity are concerned, maybe we get more from this whenever they, 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 the shooting organisations come up to speak. That I think they would be uh, happier if that was that was ex you know, expanded. You know, but as far as we are concerned, we're 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 coming at it from the you know the, the basically humane kill point of view. With regards to that aspect, and, and you know, there's no problem with that in regards to the humane kill. But looking at the 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 bandit system. That the department are proposing. Are there any anything there that concerns you or alarms you? The calibre needs to be somewhere else, or a weapon. 
Well, I, I mean, I think the only, the only thing that that that, 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 uh, that was I think in the, in the larger bore calibers, uh, I think there, there seemed to be a, a kind of was a kind of I think it was a, maybe a possible lever action gun, which I mean again I, I wouldn't have thought that it would have had the velocity to you know to meet the requirements for for deer stalking, but but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. As I said it's just a feeling, but but I mean I, I understand that that's a home <coughs> office list. You know, so what I'm saying, I think the experts have looked at this, and this is what they have come up with. And again, whilst the bands, the bandit system allows for uh, swaps or exchanges one on one, yes, th there's no, no, nothing to stop uh, a shooter or uh, a firearms certificate holder to actually apply, and, and for a larger caliber. Well, I think that, well, I think that those bands. My understanding of that is that those bands, if, 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 a, if a firearms holder, if he holds a weapon or firearm in one of those bands, then this, the new system would be deemed to have a good reason for having any of the firearms or calibers within that band, and as such, then there's no need to refer that, that back to the, the chief constable. So it's, it's that added convenience that within within those those bands and those calibers, then you can you can chop and change as you as you wish. And I think that, that was the purpose of the banded system. Yeah. With regards to the the, uh, the young shooters uh, and the the, the, the the real differential you you, you make between the uh, shooting quarry and then uh, clay pigeon yes shooting, and I understand the scenario where you present whereby it's uh, in a controlled setting, you're in a cubicle or cage, and you're 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 basically being taught to. To <clears throat> shout, to raise the firearm, to aim at the clay pigeon. You might hit it, you might not, mm -hmm. and you lower the weapon. Whilst you would be getting at a young age experience in handling that weapon, how would you ever learn trade, if you like, of, of hunting? Oh, no, uh, sorry. And, and how. how how would you be able, through that scenario for those years, how would you ever be able to know when it is safe to fire upon uh, taking into consideration your footing, where you're positioned, your situation, and the backdrop of which you're shooting into, uh, people around you? Uh, how would you ever learn that trade? Well, well, I think as far as the clay pigeon shooting at 12 is concerned, that, that, that I think what, what that covers is gun handling mm -hmm. and general and general safety. When you're moving to hunting, what we're proposing, what we're 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 advocating is training specifically for hunting, and that, that training that training would cover hunting techniques and, and, and safety while and safety while in the field, like you know, unloading before you cross an obstacle, yep. you know, showing showing clear. Well, I mean, if not showing clear would, would would be part of clay pigeon shooting anyway. But uh, I think that the that, that in terms of the the actual the clay pigeon shooting, you're going to learn gun handling. Going to be used to hard carrying a gun. Going to be used to you know, to, you know, to to use the safety catch, showing clear, and um, making sure that a gun is exactly unloaded if you find if you find it clear. <coughs> All of that would be covered. Uh, no, by, no, by just the routine of clay pigeon shooting, but when it comes to hunting life, Corey, what we're saying is that you know uh, a basic training course in in, 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 in hunting and uh, say the, that training course we say that is covering the Corey type, the Corey ecology, and you know, and, and, and the whole raft of of, 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 of dealing with uh, shooting animals. You know, so basically that, that would come through the initial basic training and also in the company of a supervisor. Because we still, still, we're not saying that, you know, that, uh, that supervise, no, super, supervision is useless. It's uh, far from it. I think it's very, very important. But the key, the key, key point of importance for me is ensuring that, that the supervisor is up to the job. And, and, and you, you can't guarantee that. You, know, you, you, just, you just can't guarantee that. So what I'm saying is the safety net is that deliver the basic fundamental training uh, for, for, for gun safety in the field initially and then go off with your supervisor. I mean, I could use the, 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 basically the example of learning to drive. I think the, the most common approach now is basically is to pay an accredited uh, driving instructor to, you know, to, to, to take the kids out, give them six lessons, and then they, 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 they then come and drive under your supervision. And you have to listen to uh, all the bad habits you, that you have that they've learned that you mustn't do during their training. So it's, 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 a, it's a similar uh, situation. You, you talk about uh, I think in the letter, I think I read it somewhere, where you 
you, you talk about a young shooter being psychologically ready to yes. shoot and dispatch quite. Uh, tell me a wee bit, you, you talk about even having a lack of respect for Quarry and my life at that point. How do you square, how do you link those two? Because if you were, if, if you were taught how to hunt, which is in my eyes completely different from shooting clay pigeons, you know, it's nearly a different craft uh, completely. But how, uh, should, I, anyone I know that is interested in hunting has utmost respect for wildlife and quarry. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can only really be generated, I would imagine, from a very, from a very young age. Mm -hmm. Being exposed to hunting at a young age, to me, doesn't endanger that. Or, but, but you seem to argue that it could well. And, and in fact, young people may be put under pressure to kill. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, that, that's a very interesting thing, because I've never, ever really experienced that, ever. Mm -hmm. I don't know anybody who ever has. Mm -hmm. Have you examples of where? Well, so, I mean, also, but my point of view is that, I mean, that, that of your talk, I mean, if, I mean, my own experience of my own children. No, you see, but I, but I, I, I never, I, I didn't take my, my, my son shooting until he asked me, could he go? And uh, he, he made that request when he was 28. Okay. Um, I, I, I've, I've been to shoots where children have been brought along. Um, so these are formal shoots, and, uh, and basically it was obvious that they didn't really want to be there, didn't want to touch the dead bird, and they were appalled by the whole thing because, again, because at a, a driven shoot, I mean, the, the birds are just knocked out of the air. Now, it's all very, it's all very good sport if that's, that's what you're into, but again, I mean, uh, my experience was that they, they, these kids definitely were not, they weren't enjoying themselves. Now, I know that you know, in, 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 in days and in years and years ago, you know, the decades gone by, maybe when it was necessary to hunt, to would really to live and survive. That was part. That was part of life, and that was part of growing up. Mm -hmm. But now, basically, you know, that, that, that's that's no longer the case. So what I'm saying is that I think that, 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 that children should be introduced. <coughs> I think you know, very very sensitively to, to to this. But I mean, but I, but I find that you no know, some some of my some of my my shooting friends. I mean, it's a big disappointment in their lives because their their children didn't they didn't want to follow them into the sport. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, so my view is is that you no, know, I mean, twelve. I mean, I have grandchildren now, and uh, and there, there's nothing that, that I, I, there's nothing would would, would uh, encourage me to really to take them out you know, to, 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 to watch me shoot a deer. But 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 is that not the same in every single walk of life? Because my two youngsters love football, and I love the fact that they love playing football, mm -hmm. but they don't play rugby. Yeah, uh, they're not interested at all. Yes. There are, obviously there's going to be young people who just aren't interested in shooting and right. don't like the idea of shooting. That's right. But, but that, that's not the sort of people we're actually talking about here. We're talking about the young people who are actually interested in shooting and... and you know, you know, if, they're, if they're interested and self-motivated to do it, yes. then I, I, I have no problem with that at all. No, 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 whatsoever. In the other scenario, it's bad parenting more than anything else. If, if you're forcing your child to do something they don't want to do, you can't, you can't really legislate for... Yeah, bad parenting. Yeah. But the point that Paul is making is that if, if a young person is psychologically ready to do it and wants to do it, yeah. then that, that's the issue we're talking about. In, in the other scenario, I think it is purely yeah. bad parenting. I don't uh, think any of us one would final, want One final question, Chair. If, 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 and they tell us all the time that a youngster, uh, you need to get a youngster young when it comes to languages yeah. uh, because yeah. it can take more in. Yes. Surely, with, your, with, with a set of good, decent standard operating procedures, Good SOPs mm -hmm. with regards to checking clear, make yep. sure you unload yep. before you cross an obstacle, river crossing, mm -hmm. whatever. Surely that can be as as quickly and efficiently ingrained into the psyche of a young person at 12 as it can at 16 or 18 or 19. Oh yes, and I, I agree with that. That's why, that's why I mean we, we have no we, we have no issue with uh, you know, youngsters going uh, clay pigeon shooting because they, they they will get that. But, but, uh, they said, but what, what I feel was, and what I said in the presentation was that I believe that at six, at sixteen, um, basically, you know, a young person, that, that I think they're more re they're more ready to decide. Yes, that's something I want to do. I'm not saying you, you can't actually take them along. Mm -hmm. I've no right, no position to do that. Yeah. 
you know, what I'm saying is, yes, by all means, I mean, uh, to, if, if children want to go along and, and see the spectacle, well, then that's fine. But what I'm saying is that it's a different thing to doing that and actually putting a gun into their hands and then and, and, uh, and urging them to really to shoot a rabbit or, or, or to shoot or, or to shoot a, shoot a bird. Now, that, that, in their young minds, I believe you know, that, uh, that, that you know, the, the making to all of them, and that was telling me that, so it must be OK. And the concern I would have is that you no, know, if, 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 if it's okay to shoot, and nobody seems to be concerned that it is de that, that, that this animal has been killed, then in their heads we'll say that they didn't place no value on that. Now, I'm saying it, but I mean, good responsible shooters will always tell me, yes, I mean, we'll only shoot something. Yes, we're going to take that home and eat it. You know, but there's lots of examples in the been in the media where you no know, bags of, 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 of dead mallard uh, that have been shot at shoots have been dumped by the side of the road, and this happens all over. You know, and so I say, so I mean, that, that, that's the kind of behaviours that, 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 that I'm aware of, and I'm sure you, you know, you must bring that, must come to, come to your own mind as well. You know, so there are irresponsible people out there, and I say, if that's, if that's the disregard they have for, for, the, for the quarry that they shoot, well then, I mean, that's a bad example to pass on to children. Okay, okay, Jim. Thank you. Just, just, just leaving the hunting aspect of it aside and, and concentrating on the clay pigeon shooting, presumably <coughs> the, the clay pigeon shooters who would practice that competitively, so we're talking about at the Olympic Games, Commonwealth Games, things like that. They would presumably argue, well, look, actually, in GB, there's no age limit at all. So they're getting young people, from a sporting perspective, much, much younger, yes. which gives them a competitive advantage over Northern Ireland when it comes to the athletes in Team GB and I or <coughs> Commonwealth Games. Perhaps it's not mm -hmm. something that your organisation can can comment on, but is it not a, is it not a, from a, a sporting perspective? Maybe the decal committee would take more of an interest. In this. Is it not better to get them younger so that we are at a sporting level competitive with other other? Yes, well, but I, I would have no issue with that. I'd say the uh, I mean the age twelve. I mean I would see the only res the only constraint really is is, is their physical um, capability of, of of wielding the gun and swinging through and hitting the target. Because I said, is it a controlled? Um, environment, so I would have no strong views in terms of, of, of young shooters in that environment. But if there's no age limit in GB, I suppose is the point I'm making, that are they at a competitive advantage to us? Because well, they're, they're able to get quite possible. Them. So I wouldn't really be qualified no, to, <laughs> to, to comment uh, meaningfully on that. Tom? Hey, Chair, thanks. Uh, thank you for the presentation. My answers have, have broadly been answered both <coughs> around the, uh, uh, the one off and the bandit system. And also the, the young shooters. Could I just ask, though, um, if there was a different age group for, for shooters at for clays as it was for for hunting or quarry or uh, deer, like yourselves, do you see any disadvantage in, <coughs> in, in, in there being a different age group? If, if there was a, an age group of uh, minimum age of uh, twelve for uh, the clays. And the minimum age of 16 yes. for uh, quarry. Do you see that as being any any disadvantage? Well, no, 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 well personally, I don't see any disadvantage because that, that's actually what we're what we're supporting it. Yeah. You know, we are supporting that. Um, I, say, I, 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 mean, just, I don't really want to go over old ground again, no, but, no, but, but, but I honestly don't, I don't see any disadvantage. I mean, as far as the, uh, the clay pigeon shooting aspect is concerned, uh, the clay pigeon shooting association <coughs> they appear to be satisfied that that's, that, that that's a reasonable age for them. Um, uh, and uh, so, so I, I just I would just take my lead really from them, and I mean, uh, but, I mean on a personal level, I feel that you know, it, it's the main constraint is the young individual, the young, individual young person's ability to actually handle the handle the firearm, you know. So, if uh, but I don't know what the experience is in in, in, in GB, I know for 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 for, for you know, I mean, they say no age. Well, I don't know what what age it would start them at. But, uh, but I, I can certainly see the, the early, earlier you, you actually start on that type of thing, then obviously the more skilled you will be. I mean, I, I accept that and I agree with that. Do you, do you have any comments to set that aside then on the cost of the firearm certificate? That has been a big issue in this. Well, well I think now that, again, um, I pay tribute again to the shooting organisations because, you know, having been there and listened to their input you know, their analysis of the actual of the figures brought forward by you know, by the business uh, consultant um, you know they, 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 I, th I think now they've now hammered out and I think, well, I think what we have is it's now validated that all of the costs um, involved in producing and processing certificate 
or they're and they're, they're now defensible. This is for the individual farm certificate. I'm not qualified to to, to really comment on the dealer side of it. Okay. But, but I, I think that my own view now is that um, we I think we the shooting for training, we have to accept that the costs are going to go up, and that, 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 that that's a given. And I think what, what tutors are interested in making sure that they're going to get value for money, and that the cost is defensible. <coughs> And this is something that we have raised with we were really at the consultation that, that even after this goes through, it, it needs to be reviewed and uh, and, and it, it needs to be it needs to be revalidated uh, validated at any time it's going to be increased. So the shooters just need to be satisfied, yeah, okay, that's the cost of it, and we're stuck with it. But we're not being overcharged for it, and we're going to get a service that's fast and efficient. And I think that, 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 that that's the key concern uh, in my experience. All right, Chair, thanks. Edwin? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it was in, wasn't in the start of the internet, apologies for that. It indicate uh, how many people actually <coughs> in your organisation? Because I was trying to find out a bit of it. Oh, yes, yes well, yep, so I can answer that. Yeah, that was right at the very start. Right. Um, our organisation is family based, the membership. And our organisation, it, it, it runs and averages over the years between 25 and, th and 30 families. That's, that's, it's, it's, so it's, uh, for a tenor a year, it's, 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 uh, it's membership for uh, all members of the family living at the same address. I went on to say that we are going to amalgamate with the, uh, with the Irish Deer Society, who, who, whose uh, values and, uh, and aims are identical to ours, okay. um, so we can form a, a, an, an All-Ireland Deer Welfare Group. Okay. And the sister organisation is the British Deer Society? Uh, no, no. The, the British Deer Society uh, is involved in, in, in shooting. We, 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 we play no part in, uh, in the lethal control or management of deer. Yeah, see, they offer training in, in, in stalking and so forth. Oh, they do it, and, and, I, and I've done it. I, I, I've followed the course. In fact, the deer stalker level one and two. But you don't do that sort of training. No, 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 no. We we'll would say we, 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 as an organisation, we're, we're purely deer welfare. Okay. I'm somewhat alarmed. <laughs> At this example too that you give, and uh, Mr. has made reference to it, um, you're suggesting here that this young person, um, who was under the age of 16, I assume, because you said his Sorry, wait, wait, which example are you referring example to? Example two. Example two. That was the one that was the, one the, the local one, one that so the, the, the shot missed the other person's heel. Yes, the one that you were supervising. Yes, yes. I, well, I mean, I, I estimate that, that he, he would have been under 15. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, but, that, that, but that's not the point. His age wasn't, wasn't really the point. It was, it was the supervision was the, was the point that I was trying to make. Yes, but you were a supervisor. No, I don't. You weren't his supervisor, no, but you, super would you say yes. you were a supervisor at the event? Yes, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And, and I don't you know. or none of the other supervisors stepped in at any point to say, oh, no, 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 this young no, man's no. handling of this gun is unacceptable? I, I did. I, 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 spoke to, I, I actually spoke to him and reported it. Yes. And, it was, it was, and then but, but I said, and he, he was talked to, his father was talked to, and... Uh, then I'd say that everything was supposed to be all right, and then. But he was allowed to hold on to the gun. Yes. I wasn't in a senior position, by the way. I was, uh, I was, I was there basically as a. Yeah. And I was controlling the line of beaters. <coughs> I would consider that pretty irresponsible supervision, and wouldn't be associated with it. Thank well, I, mean, I don't think. You're, I hope you're not trying to make me, make me feel responsible for that situation, because uh, that, that certainly wasn't the case. Oh. Uh, it speaks for itself. No, let's put it, but, 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 but that example, that, that, that's what raises my concerns mm. and, 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 and I think makes my case for ensuring that, that supervisors themselves are adequately trained and, and suitable for um, supervising and training a novice shooter. Anybody who had responsibility for supervision on that day should have intervened. Someone could have got killed. Well, eventually they did, yes. but it was almost too late. Yes, precisely. And has the person who was a senior supervisor been appointed to be a supervisor at any... Sorry, give me that again. The person who was a senior supervisor, have they been a senior supervisor well, this was, any... So this was some time ago, but it, but it was a very senior person who actually sent them off eventually. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose the world of, of shooting in general, and specifically in, in terms of shooting live quarry, is fairly alien to many people in Northern Ireland. Uh, it's 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 not something that the vast majority of people are exposed to, and certainly not exposed to <coughs> in the detail in which you've you've brought it to us today. And I mean, I think that's been that's been extremely valuable to us. 
Um, and therefore, I think it's reasonable that on behalf of the vast majority of public in Northern Ireland who do not have an understanding or an exposure to, to the world of shooting and, and particular niche area that you're involved in, um, that we have a responsibility to ensure the highest standards are applied in those circumstances. <coughs> now, you, you made the point, and others have made the point, about, about being psychologically ready to, to, to do what it is you do, which is to shoot deer. Um, and, you know, I'm sure I believed I was psychologically re ready to drive a car at the age of 13 or 14, probably did along the beach in County Donegal somewhere with my father, probably quite worried, the sitting breaks. beside me in the car. The breaks, um, but, and his hand on the handbrake, yes. <laughs> um, but the reality is the state says I was not psychologically or in any other sense ready to do that, and the state does have a right to legislate, mm -hmm. and it's vitally important yes. that we do. And I think what has come out of this session has been your responsibility in telling us that as well today, and I think that's something which, as a committee, we need to pay due care and attention to, the fact that you do believe that there is an age at which someone should be responsible. But can I, can I deal with the area of, of the standardisation of training? It seems to me that it's, it's rather, currently is rather piecemeal, um, and it, ver it ranges from the very little to sitting by Nelly, and to where there is an appropriate training course with somebody who is accredited in delivering that, and therefore there is a responsibility line in that. Yes. So if the person who has been trained makes an error, hopefully not a fatal one, um, that that can be referred back to a certified trainer who will either then have the appropriate <coughs> sanction against them or will have their, the error of the, the, the training issue pointed out to them so that that can be reinforced in future training. So can I just ask you initially how important you believe it is that there should be across all the ranges, but maybe you only want to comment on the range of shooting that you're involved in, that there should be accredited standardised training on, on which the public have confidence that if they see people, primarily men, and I want to ask a question about just how many women are involved in the, in, in the, in the sport, but when people see a car parked at the side of the road or they, they see um, people setting off for a shoot across Heathland if they're driving out in, the, in parts of Northern Ireland, they can be satisfied that that group of people are, are neither going to shoot each other or that they're going to have an accident which would involve a member of the public who might get too close or what. Well, I, mean, I believe no, you've really hit the nail on the head in regards to training and the public perception of people who shoot. And, and I think that no, the, uh, the, I think the, the, um, it's important that the public do and have an expectation that, that, that people who are granted farm certificates are safe to be, to be let loose. And, and, and I think the best way to do that is to, is to have people have a standard training course which is there you know, that people can see they see that it exists and they can see the see the, the, the quality of it. Um, and I think you know, that the you know, that the shooting organisations if they are resisting this requirement for training uh, in all areas of shooting while promoting it in one particular area of shooting, uh, I think they're they're missing a trick. Um, uh, I'm a member of a shooting club in Bangor at the moment which uh, the council um, uh, they, 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 they demolished it to build the Aurora, excellent uh, centre that it is, but, uh, but there's, all, there's, there's, there's an enormous amount of local opposition to an alternative um, range being put there, and it's because I think of the, 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 the public perception, perception people have of people who shoot. And I think you know, that this is where the shooting organisations need to get their act together to, you know, to, to try and um, you know, uh, convince the public that, you know, that, 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 that they're not dangerous people. And, that, and, 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 and I think the best way to do that is to demonstrate that, well, you can't go shooting unless you've had a thorough training and an assessment you know, before being issued with a farm certificate. And, and who, sh who should be that certifying authority and, and specifically should the police be involved in that certification? Well, uh, well uh, again, I say that the, uh, the experience and what I've discovered is that in, in, in the rest of the EU, it, t it tends to be you know, the shooting and hunting federations mm -hmm. that deliver it. I mean, they are very, very big organisations, yeah. and uh, we, we, we meet on that level. But I think that you know that, that, that the, the the deer management qualification company, I think that, that they can easily expand, and, and particularly if this becomes a, if it becomes a, an actual uh, legal requirement to have this training and assessment, well then they're looking at an open market, aren't they? 
you know, so on, but I think it would go a very long way to, um, to uh, you know, uh, building confidence in, 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 in the public. You know, if, 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 if this training is, is made mandatory. So, is it fair to say that, that as an organisation and perhaps even as an individual, you 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 do recognise that the, the simple licensing of a firearm by the police is not the whole picture, and the ability to actually certify the individual is capable of using it in either a full range of circumstances or a very narrow range of circumstances is it's equally important and it's something which the public need to be satisfied about. Yes, I, 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 I agree with that. With that. I mean, certainly what I, what I said was that well, I think it's an unjustifiable leap of faith to, you know, to, 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 to expect that a, a supervisor will, you know, if you, if you, you know, if just because he's held a certificate for four or five years, it doesn't mean he's been out shooting regularly. You know, they, they may not have, they may not have the experience of a person who's only held, held his gun for a year, and been out every weekend with it. <coughs> and, and just finally, did ask, raise the question, uh, and maybe it was just a slip of the tongue. You, you said farmers' sons. Does that include farmers? Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Yes, I, I do apologise for that, and thanks for the correction. <laughs> but I, I, I'm, but I'm yeah. also interested to actually know to, to what extent um, women are involved in the in the in the sport. Of in shooting, well, I say well, in, in stalking, I've only met I've only met uh, three three females who, who, who stalk. And, Perhaps more at the competitive and, end. But, uh, but in, 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 in target shooting, yes. Then then basically well, there, there are more, but but again, yeah. not, not they're, they're not very well represented. Or sorry, I won't say well. I mean, they're very competent shots, but there are many of them. It, yeah, yeah. Okay, I understand what you mean. Chair, thank you very Thanks, much. Stuart. I, I also noted, Stuart, the offence, the driving offence you uh, admitted to, <laughs> up yeah. outside the jurisdiction. <laughs> You're very well. Very good. <laughs> and and Pat, Patty has one very, very final quick question. Yeah. Chair, and we, we were on the risk earlier of getting into the realm of child psychology, and unless any of us are child psychologists, <laughs> you could be saying, like, Daddy, what do you do in the abattoir? Or, Daddy, what are you doing? That Moy Park or O'Keans, you know? So, um, we really, I don't think any of us are qualified, unless some of us are qualified, to go into the realm of child psychology. I don't think we should go there. But one question I should ask you. Um, you're obviously endorsing the costs, and we're scrutinising those costs, and you seem to have privy information we don't have around safe acts and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, I'll take you as read. How do you feel that introduction of additional costs would make the sport just exclusivist? Um, country sports has been... Everybody has been participated in it, where I come from, and there's one top shot who's a female uh, who would probably stand with the, with any of us, and probably better us, that I know very well in our family, and it's shootings in them, if you understand yeah. what oh, that yes, means. Oh, yes, yes, indeed, indeed, right? indeed. They're just from day dot, there are families who are just traditionally, that's yes. the way they are. Country sports, hunting, shooting, don't have to go through any psychology tests or anything, just know if they're of that family. That's what they do, and they enjoy doing it, yep. and they enjoy yep. it with care. Yes. Or the countryside and contribute hugely mm -hmm. to stocking the countryside and to various sports and indeed the entire environmental <laughs> stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and often they're involved in a range of stuff. But so back to that, how do you feel that what additional costs would add to it been just seen as exclusivist? For for with the greatest of respect to the guys in the pretty coats and the, the caps and all that, yeah. um, that's not where I come from, yeah. the sort of person that's associated with country sports. Yes. Well, as I say, well, uh, I mean, uh, my, my, my aim is not to drive people away out of the sport or price them out of the sport, mm -hmm. but I mean, my driver is that basically that the training is required and the shooting organisations, they, 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 I mean, they, I mean, if, if they can deliver the training cheaply at, at, at a rate their members can, can, can afford, well, then that, that, that's what they should be aiming at. But I think it's a case that it just can't be dealt with. And yeah, I mean, we, we won't do it because it's going to cost people too much. And it's going to, it means they can't participate in the sport. The key, the key driver is going to be, I mean, uh, is it safe? And that, 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 it's, it's got to be safe. And it can only be made safe, I believe, through training. Yeah. So, I mean, I, say, I, mean, I know that the training, and training on the continent can be very protracted and prohibitively expensive, and I mean, I, I recognise that, but I believe that the that, 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 that way it's being delivered by, by dear, uh, dear, dear management qualifications is a very reasonable cost and very, very good value, and they, 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 they deliver this training in, you know, in, 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 in short order, and that it's intense, but it's, it's very thorough and it's very well assessed. You know, so I mean, that would give me confidence that they could deliver similar training, or similar organisations could deliver similar training at, at reasonable cost.
Okay. So, right, thank you. Thanks, okay, Chair. Thanks, Patsy. Dave. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. And right. It's always valuable to get a slightly different take on these things. So yes, thank okay. you very much. Don't that's fine. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay, members, move on then to agenda item five. Representatives from the British Association for Shipping and Conservation, the, the Gun Trade Guild Northern Ireland and Countryside Alliance will now uh, join us. So, I ask them to take to the top table and just welcome Tommy Main, Director of the British Association for Shipping and Conservation, Lyle Plant, Chief Executive of Countryside Alliance, and David Robinson, the Chairman of the Gun Trade uh, Guild Northern Ireland. Just again, that you know that we're hand sorting this and all from the committee website in due course. So again, if you want to uh, quickly brief the committee, and then we'll open up for questions afterwards. So in your own time. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, good afternoon, committee. By uh, way of introduction, um, we'd like to thank the, the chair for giving us the opportunity to present to the Justice Committee. We welcome the opportunity to represent our members' interests. My name is David Robinson, Chair of the Gun Trade Guild, NI. I'm accompanied today by Tommy Main on my left, who is the Director of the British Association of Shooting Conservation in Northern Ireland, and on my right by the Chief Executive Officer of Countryside Alliance Ireland, Mr Lyle Plant. BSE and Countryside Alliance uh, are the two main representative country sports organisations in the UK. And the Gun Trade Guild and I represent firearms dealers of various size throughout the North. As well as our professional experience, collectively the three of us have been firearms certificate holders for over 95 years, and we have vast personal practical experience in the many different aspects of shooting sports, including game shooting, clay target shooting, wildfowling, pest control, deer stalking, as well as shotgun coaching and competitive shooting. Therefore, I think it is fair to say we are well versed in firearms issues and disciplines, and we have the expertise to fully substantiate our thoughts and recommendations in respect of the proposed changes to Northern Ireland's firearms legislation. From the offset, we would like to reiterate our support for meaningful stakeholder engagement and participation in the firearms consultation process. Indeed, we would like to emphasise the fact that we have engaged meaningfully, constructively and genuinely with the Department at each and every opportunity where possible. It both disappoints and indeed frustrates us that the issues surrounding many aspects of the proposed changes to the legislation have been ongoing <coughs> for a considerable number of years, and it is our genuine desire to see a satisfactory solution to these issues. To push on, I shall pass you to Lyle, who will present our proposed solution on the age reduction for young shooters. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, we ask the committee to note that we do not support the Minister's conclusion in relation to a minimum age of 12 years and the clay target only restriction. While we would like to see the minimum age reduced to 10 years of age, which is the age of criminal responsibility, in an attempt to find a compromise, we would agree to 11 years of age with no clay target restriction. We would also like to emphasise to the committee that our proposal in regard to young shots is and always has been intended to provide our young people in Northern Ireland with the opportunity to participate in shooting sports safely under supervision during their formative years. The supervision criteria we have proposed is much more robust than the system currently in place in GB, as it introduces an increased minimum supervisory age of 25 years of age with five years' experience with that particular type of firearm, which means that the supervisor themselves would have been through the mentoring process when their firearm certificate was initially granted. Unlike where GB, there is no requirement for anyone supervising a young person to actually hold a firearm certificate. The Minister's proposed clay target restriction discriminates against young people wanting to learn to shoot live quarry and vermin under supervision. The clay target restriction does not exist in any other part of the GB and no problems have been encountered. We are aware that the Minister has not enacted the will of the Northern Ireland Assembly 
who voted for no minimum wage back in March 2011. However, that amendment lacked the all-important supervisory criteria that would ensure both the safety of the young person and the public. <clears throat> Furthermore, the Department is on record when presenting to this committee stating that when they looked at the issue of young people having supervised access to shotguns in GB, there was no evidence of any problem. Good regulation is based on sound evidence and the Minister's conclusion in relation to the age being reduced to 12 years of age with a clay target restriction is not supported by evidence. Therefore, we believe that our proposed solution meets all the requirements that will allow young people to avail of the opportunity to participate in shooting sports under supervision. Our proposed solution is that the minimum age for supervised shooting using shotguns and air rifles should be reduced to 11 years of age for any lawful quarry and inanimate targets. Under the supervision of a person aged 25 years or older who has held a firearm certificate for that particular type of firearm for five years. We think our proposal is sensible, robust, and that it would allow young people to be taught safely and have respect for firearms under supervision at an early age. The supervisory criteria would remain in place until the young person reaches the age of 18 years. The current provision for 16 to 17 year olds, as per Article 7 of the Firearms Order 2004, would, uh, would remain in place. I shall now hand you over to Tommy, who will outline our view in relation to the department's proposals on the bandit system. Thank you, Lyle. May I ask the committee to note that we do not support the Minister's conclusion in relation to the bandit system. In an attempt to make some progress on the bandit system some time ago, uh, and to see how it might be incorporated into the PSNI's existing procedures, we asked the PSNI on several occasions to provide us with a copy of their policy and procedures documentation. That did not happen and we ended up submitting a Freedom of Information request in an attempt to get a copy. However, that too was unsuccessful. While we note that the Department of Justice and PSNI concerns in relation to the bandit system, we are also aware that neither the Department nor the PSNI have indeed presented any evidence to support their arguments. A broader bandit system than that currently proposed by the Department would greatly benefit both the gun trade and the 60,000 farm certificate holders in NI. <laughs> Indeed, in the words of the PSNI, it would offer considerable flexibility. A broader banded system would also be a significant benefit to the provinces, uh, sorry, to PSNI's firearms and explosives branch, as it would reduce their workload, increase their efficiency without impinging on public safety. We also believe that a broader banded system should be applied to firearms that have been conditioned for dual use, i.e., in target clubs and in the field. We further believe that the banded system should be based on the calibre of the firearm not the type of firearm. For example, a firearms dealer cannot currently exchange a 22 LR semi-automatic rifle for a 22 LR bolt-action rifle. This transaction would require completion of the relevant variation paperwork and a fee of £26 under the current schedule of fees, which would increase to £85 under the DOJ's latest <coughs> fee proposal. The Department of Justice and PSNI have repeatedly stated that the bandit system does not exist in any other jurisdiction. That does not mean that Northern Ireland should not lead the way in terms of creating the model for a more efficient, cost-effective and safe licensing system. Um, the committee has been supplied with handouts for, for the bandit system. Uh, if I could draw your attention to, to the handout. <coughs> The, the box on the left is the, our original proposal, and the, the box on the right is our compromise proposal. I think it's important to highlight that the two boxes highlighted in pink on the right are where the department currently are um, and what they have agreed to. Uh, so the boxes that, that we're uh, basically focusing on are the yellow and blue boxes. Now, we have um, reduced the number uh, of bands in the yellow box where the department had initially three and now I think two, yeah. and we've put them down into one. We've also removed one of the calibers from that. Um, we have also, if, if you look to the, the, the table on the left, large quarry centre fire, that's band four, 
we've reduced that from 16 calibers down to seven, and we believe that that's a, a, a very pragmatic, sensible compromise solution. Um, in proposing this banded system, we also propose that <clears throat> any change of legislation should include an, an enabling clause, so that later on we don't need a primary change of legislation to, to tweak it. A key factor to bear in mind when considering how the banded system works is the fact that the PSNI Firearms and Explosive Branch will have already processed the relevant paperwork and deemed the applicant fit to possess a firearm contained within the relevant bond. So we're not saying you should give somebody a firearm in a bond. The police would have already vetted and duly authorised somebody to possess a rifle in that specific mm. bond. So the, the thinking behind the bonded system is that that person who is duly authorised to possess a rifle within that bond should be fit to exchange for another rifle in the same bond that he would have been authorised for in the first place at first application, providing he met the relevant criteria. As far as our joint proposal is concerned, we have significantly re reduced the number of calibres in Bond 4 from 16 down to 7. We have also dropped one calibre, which is 218B, from Bond 3, uh, and merged the uh, medium quarry Bond 3, 4 and 5 to include the more common Fox calibres all into one Bond, which is the yellow Bond. Indeed, this is the way they are set out in the Home Office Guidance to Police 2002, which is currently used by Firearms and Explosive Branch. We believe our proposal for the banded system represents a pragmatic option for dealers and the 60,000 firearms certificate holders in Northern Ireland, and in light of our scaled-down proposal, we recommend the following rules for the banded system. As I previously said, we believe that it should be applied to firearms that are conditioned for dual use. That includes target use and field use. Generally, people who are involved in deer stalking can often be members of a PSNI-approved target club. Therefore, excluding those people who have their firearms conditioned for dual use would be doing them a great disservice. In order to maintain the integrity of the firearms licensing system, we would also suggest that target club secretaries are required to confirm their support for transactions completed under the banded system by signing a very slightly revised PSNI form confirming that the applicant is a full member of a registered target club and that the club does indeed have access to a range that is suitable for that calibre. Again, we're still on the rules for the banded system. We're saying that all handguns uh, are excluded, including or all handguns are excluded, including personal protection weapons. All muzzle loading and black powder firearms are also excluded. We do, however, feel that any firearm which is on loan should be included in the banded system, as this could be facilitated in exactly the same way that a one-off, one-on transaction is done at present, and that both firearm certificate holders must be present and complete separate forms, which a dealer then faxes to firearms and explosives branch, who then update their electronic records. Contrary to what the Department says, <coughs> there is no need to send the firearm certificates to firearms branch, as the PSNI, as I've said, simply update their electronic records. The firearm certificates can then be reprinted the next time they return to firearms and explosive branch. Again, still focused on the rules, our proposed rules for a banded system, we feel that a person under a six-month supervision mm -hmm. clause, because we must bear in mind that all new certificates or anybody moving to a significantly different type of firearm, all those certificates come with a supervisory clause. So anyone under a supervision clause could still exchange a firearm for another within the same bond, given that they are issued for the same good reason to first-time applicants. Obviously, the supervision <coughs> period should continue for the remaining period, i.e. in total six months. When changing within a bond, a change cannot be made to a firearm of a calibre which the individual already holds for the same good reason. Any transactions outside our proposed rules must be carried out under the normal variation process. We're also proposing that the legislation be changed um, to uh, allow, provide dealers with the opportunity to do um, a one-off um, transaction. So as part of the banded system and as per our original proposal, we feel that dealers should be allowed to do the one-off. That is where a dealer removes a firearm from a firearm certificate without replacing it with any other firearm. In order to <coughs> ensure the smooth implementation of the banded system, we would be happy to work in conjunction with both PSNI and the Department to draft a guidance document for firearms dealers mm. and even run a number of workshops for dealers at shared expense prior to the implementation of the banded system. To complement the banded system, we are also proposing that we move to what we call the any lawful quarry condition. 
Again, we note B, uh, DOJ and PSNI concerns in relation to their belief that the bandit system would result in difficulties with specific conditions and lands which may not be suitable for the higher calibre. The way in which PSNI conditioned certain firearms for certain types of quarry has been, over the years, problematic to say the least. Generally, when applying for the first firearm certificate or even submitting a regrant, applicants simply write sporting purposes. However, the phrase sporting purposes has caused considerable amount of confusion over the years. Neither the Firearms Order 2004 nor the guidance on Northern Ireland Firearms Controls defines its meaning, and the PSNI have refused on occasions, on many occasions over the years, to give their definition of sporting, pur sporting purposes, which we now know to be clay targets, game and wild fairly. The ambiguity around the phrase sporting purposes means that over the years a significant number of applications have been sent back to the applicant asking them to define what they mean by sporting purposes. The Home Office guidance to police dated March 2015 emphasises the use of the any lawful quarry condition. Indeed, many of the constabularies in GB are moving to that. Paragraph 1038 of the Home Office document states, firearms should be conditioned to provide flexibility with quarry shooting by allowing all lawful quarry. Paragraph 13.9 of the Home Office guidance also states, a certificate holder may shoot any quarry that is lawful where they are authorised to shoot. Whilst guidance is provided, it is the responsibility of the shooter and the shooting community to know what calibre is suitable for which quarry and when certain quarry is lawful. The Home Office guidance to police also states, a cartridge should be capable of achieving a humane kill. It is the responsibility of the shooter to ensure that any excess energy will be absorbed by the backstop. The any other lawful quarry condition, which also covers protected species that the certificate holder is licensed to shoot, should be applied. If an applicant is suitable to hold a firearm certificate and is deemed safe to do so, then there is no requirement to restrict the quarry they shoot by the use of conditions imposed on the individual's firearm certificate. In Northern Ireland, game birds, ducks, geese, waders, deer and pest birds are all regulated by either the Game Preservation Act 1928, the Wildlife Order 1985 or by general licence issued annually by Northern Ireland Environment Agency. That being the case, there is no need to further regulate the quarry species that a person may shoot by applying specific conditions to a firearm certificate. Indeed, removing this level of bureaucracy would help reduce the administrative burden on PSNI firearms and explosive brands, which in turn would allow them to focus their resources more effectively on areas where the branch has genuine concerns. With respect, um, we respectfully ask the committee to support our proposal for the bandit system going forward. I am now passing over to David, who will um, brief you on our proposal for fees. Thank you. In relation to the fees, we have adopted a holistic approach to the whole issue of fees in terms of the efficiencies of the system, the service provided, um, and we have considered not only our own system, but also the model be being used by the 42 constabularies in GB. We have examined very carefully the last two very informative reports by Mr Benny Matthews from the Bus Business Consultancy Service from DFP which gave us further insight into the internal workings of the PSNI licensing system. We remain very aware of the statement by Chief Constable Andy Marsh, the Chairman of the Firearms and Explosives Licensing Working Group at ACPO. I would say I am aware that they have now changed their name, it is now the National Police Chiefs Council, but for this I will refer to it as ACPO. And he is the chairman of that. He is also the chief constable of Hampshire Constabulary. That the sh shooting community should not be paying for an inefficient system. Mm. And for this reason and others, we cannot support real cost recovery at this time. We believe our proposal to be reasonable, workable, and will help to drive inefficiencies and red tape out of the system. Our proposal will allow the PSNI access to significantly more revenue than was given to the 42 constabularies in GB. Our proposal will also allow everyone to step back from what has become a very heated situation and regain objective focus on the very important issue 
of firearms licensing. Our proposal is based on the, re -grant, the grant and re-grant of a certificate and not a fee for an application. In the very near future, we would expect to see a significant decrease in the amount of information being repeatedly required on firearms licensing forms where the PSNI already hold the data. If we could bring your attention to pages four and five of the supplied aid memoir, um, I'll quickly take you through them. The, um, I think they're probably best viewed together. Um, you'll see in the table <coughs> is quite simply the current Northern Ireland fee, what the DOJ are currently proposing, the new current fee in GB. Right. I will make a comment here. That new GB <coughs> fee only came into force last month. It was the culmination of two years' work, which, in, which included three government departments, including the Home Office and the Prime Minister's Office. It included ACPO and 16 stakeholders. So this was not a bit of work. This was a substantial amount of work on what the cost of a licence should be in an efficient system. So I just make that point on the current GB fee. And the right-hand co column is self-explanatory. It is our proposal. And if you look to note one, you'll see that, in real terms, this produces a much higher income for the, for the PSNI than the other 42 constabularies in, uh, in GB, where the FAC renewal is only £62. The grant of a shotgun certificate is £79.50, and the renewal of a shotgun certificate is 49 quid. And I give you the examples there. So in our proposal in Northern Ireland for the grant of a firearm certificate, followed by two renewals or regrants, whatever you want to call them, because they're basically the same criteria now, <coughs> the PSNI would end up with 264 quid. Right? The money the, the other 42 constabularies are getting for the same grant followed by two renewals, and they end up with 212 pounds. And in GB, if you only had shotguns, where you had a shotgun permit, where again you had the grant followed by two renewals, you would end up with £177.50. Uh, so you can see the money on offer to the PSNI to produce an efficient licensing system is way in front of um, what the 42 constabularies in GB were given. I would also make the point that all the fees you're reading here have been inflation-proofed by us in our proposal at a rate of 2.5% per year for the next five years, with the exception of the grant <coughs> and the re-grant fee, the one I've just read out. And it's not inflation-proofed for the examples I've just given you. They're being given substantially more money to do the same job than the other 42 constabularies, and therefore didn't need to be inflation-proofed for those five years. But everything else is inflation-proofed. The grant and regrant of a registered firearms dealer certificate is currently £150, and the current department proposal is basically £830. Quid. Now, in relation to that £830, the very first review that the department did, they came up with £687 quid for a dealer's licence. Right? That was then reviewed, and they came up with £528. It was then reviewed again. Currently, and it's now 830 quid, and the minister has stated that he would like it reviewed again. The minister has stated this: he would like it reviewed again, and in the interim, he wants 300 pounds until he reviews it again. I mean, uh, the, yet when the department appear here, there can be no more efficiencies. But as these figures show, there's always more efficiencies when they're pressed, right? The um, and. The current GB fee, you, you'll often hear quoted the GB fee as being £200, so you wonder where the new current GB fee comes out at 333 quid. The point I would make here is a shotgun permit and a firearm certificate in GB is for five years, but a dealer's licence is for three, so the 200 quid is for a three-year licence. So when you flip that into our five-year licence, that's why we've quoted the new GB fee at 333 is based on a five-year cycle. Our proposal of £380 is that 333 quid inflation proof to 2.5% for five years. 
A registered firearms club is currently £80. The DOJ proposal is £71. Uh, the current GB fee is £84. And our proposal is £95 for a firearms club. Um, currently, a one on one off variation carried out by uh, the PSNI is £10. The um, DOJ proposal is £15. In the other 42 constabularies, there is no fee, and there is no fee for any variation in, in GB where you do not reduce, sorry, there is no fee where you do not increase the holding of your firearms. So if it is a one-on-one -on -one off, there is no fee. If it is a one-off, there is no fee. You only pay a fee if it increases the holding of your firearms. And we have said £17, inflation proofed that. Um, and I say there is more money that the PSNI revenue, the PSNI are getting that the GB forces are not. A one-on-one -on -one off variation by a registered firearms dealer, which includes. I don't the want to interrupt you. We have this information in front of us. I just, I'd, I'd rather have more time for questions. If certainly, if you don't no, mind, I just, just rather go over stuff. If anybody in front of us, wanted to interrupt me, and people will want to get into specific. the detail of it. So, uh, uh, yeah. Fine. If that's okay, you know, yep. uh, no, I'm fine with that. I was, I was just hoping that people were going to interrupt me as I went, you know. They, sure. uh, but um, it's, um, I mean, it, as, you, as the chairman says quite rightly, the, um, you have that there. there. There's a couple of points here. I mean, there's a summary at the bottom of what the increases are. Right. A point to note here is, is the yellow bit at the bottom of page five. It should also be noted that the latest BCS DFP review, completed on the 24th of April, noted that only 14 of the 29 FEOs are required for firearms licensing duties, and therefore the salaries of 15 of them, over half the FEOs, right, could not be billed to shooters because they're not um, doing anything that is chargeable to shooters. Um, and over the five-year span of a license, um, that amounts to 1.8 million of a saving. And further, um, there is currently and hasn't been since 2014 a head of branch at PSNI FEB. The deputy has been running the branch. So if that situation remains the same, that 1.8 million becomes 2 million of a saving over a five year. And the point I would make here in all of this is the, the department's raison d'etre for reviewing the licence fees in the first place, they quoted the figure of 36%. Right. I would make a comment is firstly that thirty six percent, which is painfully obvious to all concerned, including themselves now, was thirty six percent of a very inefficient system. It was heavily quoted by ACPO. Um, it was the use of agency staff, a lot of whom we worked in the firearms licensing system, was very heavily criticised by the PAC report on the twenty sixth of March last last year. Um, and when you consider this over <coughs> half the FEOs can no longer be charged for. And there's no head of branch in there, and you're talking about two millions. Here, you know, these are not insignificant figures. You know, so inefficiencies can be found when people are driven to them. But that's my end of my presentation, Mr. Chairman. On fees. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the, the handout as well. I think it's very useful to have this in front of us because it does go into quite a bit of detail in the three areas of young shooters' fees and, and the banded system, and it's useful for us to have that and make your position very clear on it. Now, if I just ask a, a couple of questions, I'm going to avoid the banded system in the detail because I suspect that other members who are a little bit more affair with the, the calibers and what have you will go into some detail on that. In terms of the young shooters, it's an area where I think that, that people who maybe aren't involved in shooting have, have more concern around. Uh, and I note the fact that in GB there's no age limit. I note the fact that uh, you have compromise on that issue and, and look to have the, the, the supervision. So I might ask the question earlier about how many people we're, we're talking about. How many young shooters are there in Northern Ireland? And okay. what sort of ages are we talking about here? Um, I'll answer that, Chair, if you don't mind. Um, I did note a few questions that, that weren't answered. Uh, if I can ans answer them just in the order that, that I, I, I did note of them. Um, in terms of the number of F FAC holders, to put this in, in context for you, yeah. we're roughly Roughly about 59,500 in Northern Ireland. Approximately 157 ish, thereabouts, are teenagers. Okay. Uh, you can get a firearm certificate at 16. Um, so 157 thereabouts are teenagers. Uh, that's according to the last statistics released that, that I'm aware of. The average age uh, was asked, that was a question that was asked the average age of a firearm certificate holder. 
uh, is 53. Um, and roughly 2% of the 59,500 are female. Um, okay, no, that, that, that's your job. And in terms of the, the training, I mean, again, and I appreciate that the Patsy said much of this is, is passed from generation to generation, and that's where training takes place. Is there a reason why you don't think some sort of formal training or some sort of um, qualification, for want of a better word, it would be, would be appropriate? Yeah, um, I'll answer that again. We, BISC is a training provider. We very much believe in, in voluntary training. We run, as was mentioned earlier on to the committee, uh, DSC Level 1 courses, which is Deer Stalking Certificate Level 1. Um, however, if, if we're specifically talking about the mandatory t training aspect, um, I suppose that the key, the key point here is that the Department of Justice has signed up to the Northern Ireland Better Regulation Strategy. Um, the Better Regulation Strategy promotes five guiding principles of better regulation, and the first guiding principle is proportionality. Mandatory testing um, fails the first guiding principle of the Better Regulation Strategy in that it is totally disproportionate to any perceived problem, because that's what we are talking about. We're talking about a perceived problem. Uh, indeed, BSC and the Ulster Farmers Union have written jointly to the Justice, Com uh, sorry, Justice Minister uh, some time ago to highlight that fact, and I'll just pass a copy of that joint letter. <coughs> Again, just, just continuing on, BSC, um, I'll just comment on our insurance records, and I'm, I'm sure Lau will be happy to comment on his. Our insurance records show that no personal injuries to or due to our members occurred in Northern Ireland from the use of firearms for hunting in each of the last 13 years. This reflects the fact that the current mentoring system in Northern Ireland works well. Current, currently, Schedule 1, Paragraph 1, 3 of the Guidance on Northern Ireland Firearms Controls uh, relates to firearms dealers and the requirement, the existing requirement for them to provide instruction to any person who has little or no shooting experience. Um, I, I did note that Mr. Frew commented on, uh, on SOP, Standard Operating Procedures. Well, this is basically the current SOPs, if you like. So, um, referring to, to that uh, Schedule 1, Paragraph 1, and uh, Responsibility for Firearms Dealers, it states, in the interest of public safety, the firearms dealer will provide instruction to any person who has little or no shooting experience or who is unfamiliar with the firearms in question. In particular, the dealer will ensure that the customer is able to, and then it goes into a number of bullet points, which are, pick up the firearm with an awareness of safe direction, dangerous space, and general safe handling, prove the firearm is unloaded, and safely hand it to and take it from another person, carry out a basic firearm function check, include the correct position of the safety catch and other safety features, load and unload the firearm, and make the firearm ready to fire. Additionally, as I've already said, all new firearm certificates come with a supervisory condition, which means that the holder must be supervised by a person aged 21 or over who has held a firearm certificate uh, for at least three years. Generally, that supervision, uh, supervisory period is for six months, unless the person held with the firearm certificate is 16, and then that would extend until they were 18. Article 6, paragraph 5 of the Guidance on Northern Ireland Firearms Controls states that in the case of a person being granted a firearm for the first time or who has acquired a significantly different type of firearm, the Chief Constable, in the interest of public safety, may, and he does, attach a specific condition requiring him to be supervised when in possession of the loaded firearm by a person aged 21 or over who has held a certificate for that type of firearm for at least three years. The supervisor will ensure that the novice shooter receives instruction on the safe handling and possession of firearms see protocols and pr uh, practices at Appendix 13, and to that end, he should reinforce the initial instruction given by the firearm dealer at the time of purchase. This mentoring system has not presented any problems, therefore, jointly, we question the need to change a system that works. Okay. The chair, and I'd like to say... Answered. Yeah. Sorry? Comprehensively answered, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Chair, and I'd just like to say, uh, Countryside Alliance Ireland has no claims for young people carrying out the country sports activities. And just, just for, very finally, before we go to Patsy, um, we're aware of how long this issue has been rumbling on. Mm. Uh, I'm certainly aware it's appreciated my chairmanship of the committee and has gone for many, many years. In terms of your most recent engagement with the department on your proposals that you've given to the committee here today, have you had any feedback from the department on whether there's a willingness to 
to support that, or where are we at at the moment? Uh, uh, Chair, uh, yes, we attended the last uh, fees workshop. Uh, uh, we did not submit our proposals to the department as yet, but, but we are going to hand them over to them uh, tomorrow. We are going to email them to them. Uh, there has been uh, a failure on behalf of the department to even discuss uh, the possibility of uh, young people shooting any lawful quarry, and uh, we have been working on it as an organisation for the last 12 years, and we continue to come up against uh, <coughs> that stance. Patsy. Thanks very much, Chair, and I'll be relatively brief again to emphasise your point. Um, it has taken us an incredible amount of time to get to this point in here. I'm sure your patience has been severely tested on different occasions. I don't know many times we've discussed this issue time and again, but I'm, I'm really glad that what you have taken is Tony O'Reilly's advice, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. <laughs> and uh, it, it's really laid out there, it's easily understood. And um, on, but anyway, I'll come to that now in a wee minute. I um, love the definition of easily understood. <laughs> no, sorry for. I mean, for well, it should be at the department anyway. Um, the the um, just to come to the issues there. You mentioned that there's 29 FEOs, 14. Oh, sorry, am I correct in that number? 29 of them. Right, 14 of them who are actively out on the ground, and for for everybody else, the FEOs are the people who check out. Suitability of land, suitability of premises for holding firearms, and, and uh, if people are su safely and securely uh, storing their firearms whenever an application is made or indeed a regrant is sought. But that's 14 covering 11 district council areas, and I find that incredible that it even takes that many people to cover those district council areas, given that you're not having whatever it is, 59,000. Applications for uh, either variations or regrants every year, it's every five year cycle. Um, so I find that unusual. But my question is, what are the other 15 doing? <coughs> if, if I can answer that in, in, in two parts, Mr. McGlone. To be fair to Mr. Matthews from the Business Consultancy Service at DFP, who did great work on this, right? he concluded and put it in writing. That the com command and control, if you like, of those 29 FEOs is virtually non existent. Right? So his conclusions were based, and, and he was time limited in his report, which always seems to be another problem, right? Um, that his conclusions on the FEOs is based on the information supplied to him by uh, PSNI FEB. And his personal observations, he did go out with seven FEOs, and, and sort of, for want of a better term, I sort of did a, a time and motion study with them, mm. and he came up that that for the work that's being done in the licensing system, 14 properly motivated, controlled uh, FEOs um, uh, can do that job as far as what is chargeable to the licensing system. Mm. There's other things like the ballistic testing of handguns, and other issues where the police. Um, uh, enforcement and so on and so forth that aren't chargeable to the system. So, as far as I'm aware, you know, in case any police, in case there's one of the 15 FEOs watching at the moment, I'm not aware that there's any rush at the minute that there's suddenly that 15 of these FEOs are going to be fired. They're going to be used in the system for other, um, rules. For other roles that are not chargeable to the Northern Ireland shooting community. That's grand. Uh, the point's well made. Now, just um, coming back on that. Thanks very much indeed for the work that you've done on the fees stuff. Um, as was suggested by the previous speaker, everybody accepts there has to be a fee to cover costs and the like that. But you, you've done it in a very logical way, and you've clearly put a lot of work into it. Um, the the issue of the banding. Now, um, are you aware of any Safex documents? Or exchanges around this. What, are, what I can or, say. I'm sorry. sorry. I'm, I'm asking you in that the context. You've had numerous meetings with them, with the DOJ officials and with um, with others. Yeah, are you aware of any exchanges which were? Re I think the phrase I used, uh, research based, which meant evidence grounded in fact and science, that has been used to come to conclusions around these banding 
by now the bandings you've come up with make perfect sense to me, right? And I'm not speaking as any person with a huge amount of knowledge of this, but enough probably to know. That makes huge sense to me. Are you aware or has any mention been made at any stage of in preparation of the, the suggested proposed bandings that in fact the documentation or the 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 stuff that was referred to and that we were supposed to get at this committee in fact actually exists? Uh, or has it been referred to at any stage? At our last workshop, <clears throat> we, well, we asked the question again when we were talking about the bandit system, and uh, it was uh, we were informed that there was no written report on CIFAX. Uh, there was no CIFAX report, and it was a verbal report received only that formulated the bandit system. Oh. Right. Well, previously, Chair, I think if that's the case, I think we'd need to follow that up with the officials, or more importantly with the Department, if incorrect or, dare I say it, misleading information was given to a committee. Um, that's, that would prove to be a very serious issue. Um, so um, thank, thank you for that. Um, then on um, the final thing then on the young shooters, I think you've covered that pretty well. But there's one issue that I want to um, test, to use the phrase, or use the word, mandatory testing. Now, can you give me the experience, because it was earlier we heard the evidence that this would be important, this would be useful and all that. Can you give me the experience of how, in those countries, for any of the mainland European countries where mandatory testing has taken place, indeed any incidents of... Um, Fatalities or injuries that have that have and compare and contrast those with we've heard already about the that it, your, yourselves in terms of claims have been incident free both your organisations and where there is the other organisation that covers insurance as well that's the, the Scottish Association yeah. in, in the north here but can you give me any figures or would you have any indication say comparison with GB or with say the European mainland that you could give us where mandatory testing has been introduced because I am concerned. You're obviously concerned about safety, and safety doesn't matter whether it's on the roads or shooting or use of electricity or anything. You're always concerned about safety of individuals. Um, but you also want to find out if the theory of mandatory testing actually works, because we don't want, as the point said, it to become an exclusive of sport and fewer people participating in it at the same time. So, but, but yeah. Okay. <coughs> Firstly, I would say mandatory testing makes no contribution to public safety because it seeks to solve a problem which doesn't exist at this point in time. However, to, to, to go to the specifics of your question, Mr McGlone, France has a mandatory testing regime, and in 2013-14, 43 people were killed whilst hunting. Right. Sorry, this is presumably not through an animal hitting, and this is as a result of a firearm. Right. 43 people. And they have mandatory testing? Yes. And can we benchmark that with England, Scotland, or Wales, or anything? Say what? Where they uh, have the mandatory testing system. Conversely, the UK has no mandatory testing regime, and only two people were killed unintentionally in 2011. Okay, right, chair. I think that's. But where, where are those figures? Where do you get those figures from? Aye. Uh, from head office. <laughs> <laughs> and do, do you have figures for the, for? Like a pan-European table of, of that? Yes, you know, head office. Always cost of picking out one country. No, we, we have a specific firearms department that head office and any information like that that, that we be, need. Maybe we would have to share that with us as well. Yes, certainly, be, no problem. Mr. Benchmark, I think it would be useful. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Chair. Thank you. Um, maybe just to follow through on that, and it would be interesting to get those figures because I appreciate the very serious nature of the information that you've given to us. Um, would it be also the case that there are substantially more licensed firearms in France than there are in Northern Ireland per head of population or the rest of the United Kingdom? It, it wouldn't um, vary that much in the, other than the fact that ours is skewed slightly by our rifles, so we have more firearm certificate holders because yes, we, we have hold our rifles. But on a like-for-like like basis, my perception is that France would be substantially larger in terms of the number. Well, the, the country is four times the size, but the population well, is the same. Well, yeah. FUK. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, but, but, but I mean, I accept that, that you've got figures that would be very helpful for the committee mm -hmm. to have a look at, at, at those. Can I just ask, in relation to exchanges, which you made reference to, 
What, what do you see, or do you see any risks to dealers in doing that rather than the current situation? No, I, I, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, to refer back to the fees, you know, they're talking about moving the, the PSNI, the current variation fee is 26 quid. It just, we're talking about not turning this into a rich man's sport. Yes. Right? 26 pounds, right? Now, one of the significant things about the two years that worked done in GB, their fee was the same, and they actually reduced it to 20, which I thought was very significant. Whereas the department here are saying that they can, they can grant a firearm certificate for 98 quid. They go through all that process for an eight pound, but if you want to vary your firearm certificate, mm. right, a very simple variation, it's going to cost eighty nine pounds. Mm. We're talking about exchanges here, which yes, but the, uh, your proposal is that dealers will deal with that. Yes. How is the public protected in that? Uh, public pr protected in what sense, Mr. Dixon? Uh, in the sense that you're conducting the exchanges rather than the exchange being. Dealt with directly by the PS now. But, but, no. We currently do one on one offs uh, for shotguns anyway. You do? We, we currently do one on one offs for any gun that is done for the same calibre. Right. Uh, that, that is currently done by us. Okay. Uh, you know, so, so there, is, there is no public safety issue in this. The, the thing is, is uh, agreeing okay. that the band, bearing in mind that those uh, in our proposal, if you look at the Fox calibres, for example, yeah. that um, if you were applying for a Fox calibre gun uh, as your first. Fox caliber uh, right. rifle, um, and once you've been through that uh, vetting process by PSNI, they will grant you permission for any one of those calibers. Yeah, no, I understand. And then you have the six-month supervision. supervision. And if you move from one band to another, there's another six-month supervision. So it's not an initial guy gets six-month supervision when he's 18 and he goes from an air rifle to a fox caliber to a deer caliber. Right, okay. There's there's more six months. There's more. There's being more. Slaughtered okay. in. That, 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 that's very helpful. Can I then, then just move on briefly to, to the issue of the age uh -huh. of young shooters? Um, and, and you've suggested that a compromise is, is 11 rather yeah. than 10. It, it's Surely the situation is that it, it's important that there is public confidence in any changes. Uh, and, and I think that goes right across all of what's being proposed here. And I go back to your own figures and your own information, where you say that there have been no accidents and no um, it, no major incidents in relation to this. Therefore, any dilution should be an issue for concern not only to the public but to yourselves for the high reputation which you currently hold. You must surely jealously wish to guard the reputation we currently have. And if any change to that led to, to an incident, then all that you've been trying to do would be, you know... Undone. Would be undone. Yes, exactly. Mr. Yeah, Mr Dixon. Uh, I completely agree with you. You know, our, uh, our aim is for public safety, and not only public safety, but the safety of the young person, mm -hmm. and obviously the safety of the supervisor. <coughs> that is why we've increased the proposed uh, supervisory age yeah. to 25 years and five years, yeah. which means that that person would have held a firearm certificate for a full term and would have had to be regranted with a second firearm certificate. Uh, uh, therefore, therefore, the level of expertise in place is actually higher than the current is at the moment. Yeah. But, but that five years holding of the, the licence doesn't require any training? Yes, it does. That person still has to undergo a six-month probationary period when he first gets his firearm certificate. But four years on, a long way from that. It's not so much. He's gaining, he's gaining experience as, as, as Well, he may not have lifted the rifle during that entire time. Well, the problem is, that the, the, the thing with that, Mr. Dixon, is, and I've heard this mentioned before, that he might only fire 100 shots. Mm -hmm. right? the, the, the Part of the good reason for holding a firearm is that you're actually going to use it. Mm -hmm. So if his licence goes in at the end of the, the first five years and there's no ammunition has been bought for it, he's failing to demonstrate good mm -hmm. reason mm -hmm. and okay. is the renewal will, yeah. at that point so, will so be the right. Well, that, 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 yeah. that's very helpful. So the renewal yeah. is at least in part con yeah. con one of the considerations. Is a check? Is the amount of use that the that the, that the weapon is? Yes. Okay. And I think Tommy just wanted to. Um, uh, if I could just 
With respect, sure. correct, Mr. Dixon, um, he used the term rifle there in relation to young shooters and the supervision. We're not talking about rifles, we're talking about air rifles and we're talking about shotguns and a supervisory clause of 25 and five years' experience. So we're not talking about bullet firing rifles. No. Okay. Thank you. Um, the potential caution um, that I think the Department are trying to, to demonstrate <coughs> in relation to any age change. Uh, and it goes back perhaps to the issue we were talking about when it came to the, the, the um, deer hunting as well, is the level of maturity and the change point in people's lives. In Northern Ireland, young people change from elementary school, primary school to secondary school at the age of 12. They're, well, they're still there at 11. Um, I, the thought of, of uh, perhaps a young person saying, uh, I'm going to get a, uh, a, a firearms licence to their colleagues in a class in a primary school seems to me something that's, that's quite concerning and that perhaps it should be left until the point or age when somebody moves to secondary school level. Um, firstly, we're not talking about giving farm certificates to 10-year-olds. We're simply talking about letting them, letting them shoot yeah. under supervision of a responsible supervisor. Um, <clears throat> but even that, even that commentary amongst their peers. Well, I think, you know, Lyle said earlier on that, that, that we said that there have been no, no issues across GB. It's actually the department who said when they looked at GB they could yeah. find no evidence. So it's, it's not us that said that, it's the department. So I think, you know, if, if we look at GB as a benchmark and look at any problems that have been encountered over there, and there have been none mm. that, the, that the department can produce, then we've got a question. Why are we holding things up here? You know, why, why are we saying 12? I mean, I, I can still recall... Um, the department's position back in a meeting in my office last year, and it was 12, take it or leave it, and that was the phrase that was used. But can you also understand, and to go back to the point that I raised with the gentleman from the DEER organisation earlier on, that for the vast majority of people who have no knowledge of or no understanding of um, what goes on in your particular areas of sport or sports, that, for example, and I know you're not, I know you're not actually proposing this, but for example, the thought of saying to the general public in Northern Ireland that you were going to reduce the age from <coughs> 12 to zero would, would fill the vast majority of the population with horror. Not Therefore, there. any change in an, age, in an age has to be very sensitively and very, very robustly defended in terms of making those changes. Mr. Dixon, if I can just say to you. That the Firearms Acts in England have been in since 1968, and as far as I can de determine on Google, there's been 244 chief constables appointed to the various police forces in England since that period, and not one of them has expressed a worry about young people shooting. Well, I, I'm not and, and I would also say, in relation, don't get hung up in this age of 11, because we didn't want 11. You wanted 10? We wanted 10, precisely. So the only reason that 11 is being offered is as a compromise. And further, in relation to the clay target shooting, that was never part of a consultation process by the department. It was first; it was news to us when presented to this committee on the 18th of June last year. Allowing, so it wasn't even consulted on. Uh, but, but allowing 10-year-olds access to a weapon is something which would cause great deal of concern to the general public, in my view. Uh, Mr. Dixon, uh, I don't think so. I don't believe so. Not if it's. Uh, uh, correctly handled, uh, correctly publicised, and the supervisory criteria is in place. Uh, and and uh, I would prefer uh, that they're not called weapons; they're called firearms. Firearms are for use uh, for shooting and sporting purposes. The other, the other small point I would uh, make to you, Mr. Dixon, is we're not suggesting that this becomes mandatory. First of all, the young person has to want to go shooting. Yes. He has to have parental consent. They have to find a supervisor who is prepared to supervise that young individual. This is about freedom of choice and parental control. And to that extent, what pressure is on you from parents, because, or indeed young people, who think they can persuade their parent to allow them to take up shooting at the age of 10 or 11? There is a significant, a very, very, very significant desire for a change of legislation that would allow young people to shoot under supervision. Can you, can you, can you enumerate that first? Can you actually demonstrate that to us? Well, BASC is the largest shooting organisation in the UK with a membership of over 140,000, and I've yet to meet somebody that says no. 
And, 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 for, and, and furthermore, um, to, go, to go back to your point that you raised about the public uh, being horrified or words to that effect about no minimum age, um, I would disagree uh, with respect because there is no minimum, no minimum age. That, that scenario exists already within the controlled environment of a, a PSNI gun club, which is a bullet firing club. <coughs> there is no minimum age there. If, if I can also say to you, Mr. Dixon, as well, if you're talking about uh, you know demand, you know where the department got their demand for clay target shooters, and we're not against that. No. We're, we're talking about everybody should be on an equal footing. We're just trying to stop the discrimination that's there and to continue. And what I can say to you, when you talk about demand, is in relation to 16 and 17 year olds, there's 32 16 and 17 year olds have a firearm certificate in Northern Ireland currently, as we speak. 32. 11 of those certificates are conditioned for the protection of livestock, which leaves 21 16 and 17 year olds who come under the heading of have a condition, which is an umbrella condition called sporting purposes. And sporting purposes includes clay target shooting, game shooting, and wild fowling. So the number of 16 and 17 year olds who hold a firearm certificate for clay shooting could be zero or 21. I just don't know, but I mean, if, if you're talking about the levels of demand, I mean, where did the department come up with their thing on clay target shooting over? Where did they get their demand figures from? You know. Thank you. If we can just comment, Chair, in relation to uh, my last answer to Mr. Dixon there about bullet firing clubs, um, the department's current position is that they, the minister's current position is that, that the department would regulate or the police would regulate bullet firing clubs under Article 49 of the guidance. That, that's, that's currently the case. They regulate bullet firing clubs under Article 49, and their proposal is that they would regulate clay target clubs under the same article, Article 49. But to give you the, the anomaly there is that, as I've already said, there's no minimum age currently in a bullet firing club. But, but what the department are trying to do is introduce a minimum age of 12 for a clay target club that they intend to regulate under the same article, I, which doesn't make sense. I'm, I'm, I'm slightly confused, but I, I really do now need to understand what a bullet firing club okay. is, where, 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 okay. where, where what you're saying is very young children could have access to guns and use them. Yeah, okay, albeit in a very controlled right. environment. A bullet firing club is a, a PSNI approved gun club that shoots on, on an approved range. There's no minimum age restriction and it has never caused any problem. However, the clubs will generally regulate themselves and apply a minimum age where they need to, yeah? depending on the type of firearm, the size of the young person, you know, psychological ability and all the rest of it, which is assessed by a supervisor. And there is a requirement under our Article 49 for one-on-one -on -one supervision. However, con to put it in context for you, that's the way an existing bullet firing club operates now. So if we were on, let's say, Barnes Court Range in County Tyrone, and this was a range, and we're firing bullet firing firearms that way into the targets in the sand pit. There's no minimum age. Supervision criteria is that the supervisor has to be a full member of the club. That's it. Very straightforward. No problem. It works. However, under the department's proposal, we would then step out of that to go and shoot shotguns, where there would be a minimum age of 12, and there would be some sort of qualification or training required for the supervisor. It's it's absolute. Madness. If you're telling me that it's madness because there's no minimum age, I entirely agree with you. No, not at all. I'm saying that there is there is a criteria that that is applicable to bullet firing clubs at the minute. It's never caused any problem. And what the department is is proposing to do is introduce a minimum age where there's no problem. Again, it's contrary to the better regulation strategy, which the department has signed up to. I appreciate the better regulation strategy, but I'm coming at this from a member of the general public's perspective, mm -hmm. and I have serious concerns about it. Up to maybe on it, thank you, Chair. Okay, Raymond. Uh, I just want to concentrate two things on the fees. Yeah. Uh, the the proposals, uh, as outlined, the two big gaps seems to be for the dealers. Uh, the department want eight hundred twenty-eight pound. You suppose three hundred and eight. How many dealers is it? Well, that's sort of interesting because uh, this time last year there was 108, and today there's 92. So we've lost 16 dealers in a year as a mixture of 
unresolved firearms dealer security spec and this fees issue going on and on. Does the guy want to pay the fee and then get hit with some draconian dealer security spec? Um, the, the minister hasn't moved, the department hasn't moved on um, looking at the categories of dealers, so there's, there's a whole sort of mix going on in there, and the minister is going to cause in, call in uh, the consultant again to review all of this. I mean, frankly, where does this stop? Where, where, where do we produce a, a, you know, an actual proposal? Because as things stand at the minute, the department have no proposal for a bandit system, and they have no complete proposal for fees. And so we are sitting here today with what our proposed solutions to those issues are. But, I mean, the current gap is about £45,000. Yes, but the thing you have to bear in mind is what the fees that we are proposing is more money than was given to the other 42 constabularies to, be, to yeah, become no, efficient. I, 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 There's no, new fees in there. Yeah. So this is what I meant with the holistic r approach, okay. in the sense that if you're going to use the system more often, um, what we're proposing is you will pay more. Uh, and in terms of the variations carried out by the PSNA, many, many variations to the PSNA carried out? Uh, 4,000. 4, so, so the gap there is about a quarter of a million pound? Yeah. Okay. Yes, and and what, what I would say to you is, I'd, I'd refer you back to the yellow bit at the bottom of page five. Yeah. Where, where does that start getting anywhere close to, to their figures of of 36 percent? You know, in terms of of running um, a budget. I mean, one of the ludicrous things, which you, some of you may notice, would you have time to study the fees? That we don't mention a 10-year license, because the department has come up with a figure of 98 quid for a five-year license. But if you want a 10-year license, it's 266. You know? No, but, I, I, that's a, but I, I mean, in terms of, I mean, as you say, it's been going on now a, a long time, and even today we're back around many of the same issues. But at least your proposal now is going to the department tomorrow, and we'll try and see what it is. I mean, the only two gaps from the chart laid out seems to be dealers and the variations. So it, it's, it's, it's how you narrow that. The, you um, know, and if well, we tell, but if you tied up the R figures, mm. I mean, there, there's some of your proposals are higher than the department's. Yeah. So if the figures are tied up, do they equalise out? Yes. Well, the thing is, that we have looked at, at at the thing, as I said, holistically, and we have taken into account. Bearing in mind that the department are quoting figures which, which are totally ridic ridiculous. I mean, you know, um, they sort of casually missed 1.8 millions, and you know, and an employee threshold of 64. Do you know what I mean? And we actually brought this to the attention of the committee. In fact, it was actually you and I had an exchange in this yeah. uh, back in February 2013 about the, the use of FEOs. Yeah. And the point we're making here in, in our approach to this right, <clears throat> is that here is a workable, feasible proposal from our point yeah. of view. Um, we have looked at everything in the round, so we're not sitting. I mean, if you look at it the other way, you, you know, one-on-one -on -one off variations. We're, we're saying here 17 one-on-one -on -one off, including the banded system done by dealers. Well, I mean, dealers currently do uh, five thousand a year one-on-one -on -one off variations at, at twelve quid multiplied by five years. That's three hundred thousand yeah. pounds, which they haven't got now. You know. Um, you know, and the fact that we are offering them more money than all the other constabularies put together on fifty pounds an application. You know, we have gone through. It's not a case. Uh, I, I don't think Mr. McCartney is looking at that one's different to that one. So that's only where it has to be closed because we did this in the round. Um, that the more often you use the system, the more you pay. So it's it's not just clear cut that that they're saying eight thirty and we're saying three eighty. It's not as clear cut as that. You know, no, I, I appreciate that, but I'm saying, but in terms of trying to bridge the gap, I mean, I mean, there's going to be no meeting the minds in them two figures I've laid out. There are proposals well, that I imagine the, part, the department will accept. Yeah, yeah. For example, um, uh, uh, the department's variation feed carried out by the PSNI yeah. at 8903. Yeah. A person goes into a, a registered firearms dealer, wants to buy an air rifle at £90, right? And then he's asked for another £90 to, to put it on his licence. That makes that air rifle too expensive. And then precludes people from starting uh, out in the sport or uh, taking up a new activity. You know, uh, as Mr. McLone says, we you know it's it, oh, we can't make it exclusive. There has to be 
available to everyone and it has to be affordable to everyone. And we believe that uh, the work that has been done in these fees by David and ourselves has uh, delivered what we believe is a workable solution going forward. The other thing I would mention to you, Mr McCartney, as well, is, is that you know, it's, it's, it's Murphy's Law, the Law of Unintended Consequences. The, um, I mean, the, the, the Department are, are pricing a licensing system which is now in place, you know, but we're taking into consideration here uh, the banded system for a, license that, <coughs> for a licensing system that could, uh, in some description, will, will be in place. The other thing will be in place for five years, because that will allow the, the PSNI licensing system to become more efficient, and it will help push them down that road. Right? And uh, furthermore, the system that is in place in GB uh, will be tested by them. It will have been in place for two or three years. They're going to have a look at it and review it. So whenever we come back to this issue, and there's substantial rises in there, and even the minister himself recognises that there's something wrong with that dealer's fee. But you know, after three reviews, I mean, you know, where, where, where does it all stop? So what we're proposing is is to draw a line under this for five years. There is a workable fees proposal in there, far in excess than what any of the 42 GB forces got. And if the PSNI decide to become efficient, there's more that will certainly cover the cost of a firearms licensing system. I, I, I just make the general point, but after these proposals go on tomorrow, like there's there's not much more room for discussion. So it's, you know, it's yeah. uh, whatever happens after tomorrow, we need to be in a position to make decisions. Yes, that, that, that that's the, the broad point. So in the gaps in. All the R proposals aren't great between yourselves and the department. The only two big gaps is uh, the dealers and the variation. Which is counteracted by but, the, by the only have to pay for half of the FEOs. Yeah. But the, 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 I'm, I'm not making a new case yeah, yeah, for, yeah. for the department. All I'm saying is you just have to resolve that or we'll be back the, in the same place. The, the, the point I'm yeah. making is in, in, in doing this, I mean, we would imagine the number of those variations would drop, right? And because of the, the unresolved issues, uh, of the dealer security spec and the fact that there is no fees in place, all you know, you know, 16 small dealers handing in their license in the last year, you know, is not an insignificant number, and yeah. a bit of a total of 108. Um, and in terms of the dealers, I mean, that's that's not a big lot of money, you know, and we have made allowances for it because currently, I mean, <coughs> we're doing 5,000. I mean, if you look at the difference there and the fact that we're agreeing to a 12 pound. Variation fee, which is currently free <coughs> by dealers, which will generate three hundred thousand pounds. I mean, your, your, your two queries are, are, are negated by that, plus the fact of the cost saving of one point eight millions, which could well be two millions. You know, and that's before we get into things like postage and you know, electronic things. You know. <laughs> All I'm saying is your proposals, no, so far look fine, but there's two gaps you have to fill. Between yourselves and the department, that's what. So, uh, if I could just comment, yeah. Mr. McCartney, on, on, on your comment, um, I think we need to bear in mind too that the department get their motivation from DFP guidance, managing public money, in terms of going for full cost recovery. Um, we also need to be cognizant of the fact that that same document, DFP guidance, sets the standards that a public service must meet, and those standards are understood to be fairly high. Those standards include accountability, transparency, openness, fairness, objectivity, etc., etc., etc. And I think the, the members of the Justice Committee, who are also members of the All Party Group in Country Sports, know the background to some of these issues uh, that have been ongoing for a considerable number of years. For example, David has just spoke very briefly on the Farms Dealer Security Spec. The way that that has panned out for the information of this committee. Um, we have said all along, since it was introduced in 2012, that that, that security specification was inappropriate. The police have now realised that it's inappropriate for small dealers, and made that comment at the last meeting on the 15th of, of May. Uh, and as far as they're concerned, it's dead in the water. But the fact remains, we have lost how many dealers? 16 in the last year. 16 dealers over the last year. We had 119 when this process here started, and we're now down to 92. And the fact that that, that security spec will ultimately have been responsible for putting, not all, but certainly a number of those dealers out of business, and I think that is a very damning indictment on PSNI, FEP. Paul. 
Yeah, I think you, uh, it's all been covered around the young shooters, and, and certainly I have no problems or qualms with regards to a wage limit uh, under you know the strict supervision and, and scrutiny that, that comes with the trade, if you like, and, and the way that it's administered. And, and you're quite right, if there's no problem there, why are we legislating for it or administrating something for it? Uh, so I would, I would, uh, I have no problems there. What I want to concentrate on, centre on, is the actual cost recovery. Uh, Mr. Main has just raised it there. Tommy, you have just raised it there with regards to the the responsibility of a of a government department, uh, and there is certain pressures on them around cost recovery, and we hear that all the time. But but I think it was Mr. Robinson who, and I know that you have been dealing with this long even before I became involved in politics ten years ago. Uh, well, how could they have come up with three or four sets of figures, or three sets of figures, in three reviews, and then wanting to go through a fourth review with with numbers that are nowhere near the same? I think you you talked about a 500 figure, 700 figure, and an 800 figure. The original one was 697, the second <coughs> 528, and now we're at 830, and the Minister wants to review it again. Yeah. If you're asking my personal view, I'd lost the will to live at that point, and we just went ahead and, and, and worked it out ourselves. Yes, yeah. I mean, but, how many tens of thousands of public and private money and public and private time has yeah. to be wasted to, to come to a conclusion to this? Because I'm quite sure us, I know for a fact we have, and I am absolutely sure that you have other equally important things to be getting on with. How long is this going to drag on with? And we have bent over backwards. We have jumped through every hoop for the Department of Police. There has been no genuine engagement in their part. I would ask the Department and the PSNI in relation to public safety, and they repeat this phrase like a mantra, but never explain it on a specific issue. And I would ask this committee to ask them to produce to this committee right, any document that ever, in, for example, in relation to the banded system, where they laid out what their problems were with any band. I defy them to produce it to this committee, because it never happened. And this has gone on. I mean, this review. I mean, I know you talk about 2011. This has been going on since 1995. 1995. This all started. 20 years. This has gone on, and this sort of sticking plaster approach. And I've, I've said it before. Until the, f the formation of this assembly and this committee, where uh, and the all-party group on country sports were people who said, "Let's try and fix this," because I know on a, on a much grander scale. People refer to the legacy of the past on some very extraordinary, important issues. Well, so is this. The firearms licensing system is a legacy of the past, and it's a disaster, and it needs sorted out. And even when it was written, I mean, I, I remember even Lady Herman, not known for her shooting prowess, said it was one of the worst bits of draftsmanship she'd ever seen, and she was absolutely right. Uh, given the, given the craftsmanship or not, uh, what I find when I when I try and deal uh, with the PSNI on individual licensing and also uh, inter, uh, interactions with dealers, some of which I know we have went out of business for one reason or another, uh, and, and the trying to get a human face to talk to you, trying to get information that is relevant. Uh, is very, very difficult uh, and fills you with nothing but frustration. Uh, there's no human face and they turn their face away from you when you do get one. Uh, they, they don't seem to be accountable to anyone uh, and uh, they seem to do their own thing at their own speed. And it is basically, as far as I can see, crippling and stifling the, the industry or the trade or the sport or all three. Uh, but, and that's just the PSNI. But here we have a DOJ uh, who seem to think that it is justifiable to state that full cost recovery will be in the region of £800 for the grant uh, and regrant of the for the registered firearms dealers. Yet in GB, it is nowhere near that. Yeah. Uh, now, my question is my question is not is this or is this not full cost recovery? My question is how are we running a system that is costing so much? Now I know I'm asking the wrong people, but in your opinion, and I, I think you, you do you, you cover a part of that with regards to the yellow 
uh, highlighted by, in, the, in the second page. But how have we ever got into this mess where we cannot run efficient and effective service in the licensing and registering of our firearms and our firearms dealers? I think, Mr. Free, from <coughs> my own experience in this, is it's always been a stick and plaster solution. I think, historically, in the days of direct rule, that the departments and the police could trundle along to a direct rule minister and say, that's what we need, and it was signed off on. Um, there was no public scrutiny of these decisions. Um, there was no opinion sought, and if they got them, they could be easily ignored. Um, and the system has just been allowed to bump along. I mean, the, the current 2005 order, I mean, the first date on that order was actually the 2002 order. Right? And that had been, be, was being reviewed from 1995 to get to that. They still couldn't get it in. And basically what happened at the end of it all was they looked at the GB legislation because somewhere somebody along the line gets them to kick up the backside. And they grabbed bits of GB legislation and slammed it in to the 2002 order. And it became the 2004 order, which they couldn't even enact in 2004. It didn't actually become law to 2005. And there's just been this piecemeal approach. And, and frankly, while we've been dealing with, with these issues, I mean, if you were asking me the bigger question, which I uh, know to be a fact and sincerely believe, that whole firearms, the whole firearms licensing system in Northern Ireland needs to be overhauled from start to finish. The, um, and I assure you, if, if I'd won the £13.5 million last night on the lottery, I would be spending a few, a few of those millions on judicial review, and I would win, mm. because you could drive a horse and carriage through it. Do, do, this this uh, uh, table of fees that you've produced, and, 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 and it is that part of it is very easy to read, and you've, you've very kindly hi highlighted and, and, and noted it uh, uh, on a, a, a second page, but uh, this really does depend on a bandit, the bandit system that you propose also. It's connected, the two can't be yeah. in, 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 in terms of the holistic approach, you know, we, we, we looked at the fees, uh, the, the realisms of operating in Northern Ireland. We looked at the GB system, we looked at uh, efficiency, we looked at the service being provided that maybe other jurisdictions didn't have, and we looked at you know where they were, you know, the, uh, I mean, in some ways you could say the fact that they run a two-tier system in England, that's actually even more efficient, inefficient, sorry, than, than what we have got. Mm -hmm. You know, so, uh, we, you know, between us, I mean, we, we sort of debated a lot of issues, and they are connected to things like the banded system. £89 for a variation without a banded system, right? The, uh, you'll have no more issues with firearms certificate holders because there won't be any left in Northern Ireland. It'll just it'll <coughs> kill the sport, this business, <coughs> dead in the water. Dead in the water. The, uh, for the working man to be paying that for, for a, a change of a single barrel shotgun, you know, that, that's just a rich man's sport. Yeah. Okay, Chair, I'm, I'm content to leave it at that. Thanks, Paul. Oh, this was your turn for question. <laughs> okay, um, thanks for that. I'm um, going to ask the, the organisations. I'm sure, you can bring your members with you on, what, on your proposals because it strikes me that you're being pretty generous in that. I think there's 11 um, fees down there, and nine of them are more expensive here in Northern Ireland. What you're proposing than what the most recent GB fee structure was? I think, Mr. Pitts, uh, in relation to that, again, it's looking at the, the banded system, because while some of these are, fair, are you know, like the variations, we would expect for, with a banded system the 4,000 variations uh, would decrease rapidly, because a lot of them would be actually covered uh, by, the, by the banded system. Mm -hmm. so the, and the, there's other issues here. There's things, certain frames that we have that we, we can do the one-on-one -on -one offs with a dealer. Um, and one -offs with and, and one-offs with a dealer. Uh, to um, keep those costs as low as possible. So, well, you know, with, with the uh, the leg of the, the banded system, you know, we would see the, the currently four thousand a year being done by listen to Shara dropping dramatically. So instead of paying eighty nine pounds, they, they would be paying uh, twelve pounds. Yeah. I think everybody, every responsible shooter, um, uh, 
recognises that the fees have to go up. Yep. And I can I can tell you historically, um, up to the 2005 order, it was £28.50 for three years. You signed one sheet of paper, you fired it in, it was, 20, it was £9.50 a year. 2005 order went up, went up to £10 a year, £50 for the five-year licence. But to be realistic, the last time the firearm, firearms licence in any degree actually went up in Northern Ireland was 25 years ago, in 1990. So I think every every reasonable person nobody wants anything for nothing here, yeah. and, and that's not besides the 28 million that shooting puts <coughs> into the Northern Ireland community. So I'm quite sure that there will be the odd uh, keyboard warrior who will be shouting about if this went up by one penny, right? But I don't see those keyboard warriors sitting in front of this committee with a workable proposal. Yeah. No, I think the, the proposals are, are very reasonable and fair, and, and get their Quite a number of them, the vast majority of them are above what's what's being lifted. Did with the department and, and work with them on funds. Okay. So I don't need to ask any questions about the twelve year olds, I think it's adequately dealt with. Okay. Thanks everyone. Just, just, and just a quick question, man. you said that you have engaged with the department in a meaningful way. Have they done likewise? And where from where do you go from here? Uh, well, we have engaged with the department, and when we have engaged with them, they have engaged with us. However, we believe that the department officials have been uh, have stuck to their guns. They have uh, remained with their original proposals and unwilling to. Uh, Obviously, they're implementing what the minister wants, <coughs> and and we completely understand that. And we came back from wanting 10 to 11 uh, to try and make a compromise. We increased the supervisory age from 21 to 25 to to try to see could we meet somewhere in the middle. So no flexibility. And and there was no flexibility <coughs> in that situation regarding the fees. We went to the fees. Uh, meeting and the fees workshop. However, we didn't have time to fully uh, digest and, and look at the fees that were proposed. Therefore, they will be getting their proposals by email tomorrow. Yeah, Tom. Uh, I think it's, uh, I'd just like to uh, reiterate Lyle's comments, but I would also say, in terms of engagement and, and genuine engagement, more importantly, with both the department and the police, there have been a number of occasions when the department have given us extremely short notice um, in relation to meetings that they had called. Now, we're talking one or possibly two working days. Uh, given that Lyle and I are the heads of representative, very large representative organisations, it doesn't really work well with our carry scheduling. So we do try and accommodate those meetings where and when we can, but we obviously need a considerable degree of flexibility. Um, we have voiced our concerns to both the department in relation to the short notice meetings and more recently to the PSNI because they've done something very similar. Okay. Just, just to finish off, Mr. Lewis, I, mean, I would say you know, from the trade point of view, it, one of the problems, and particularly in relation to the young shots, is uh, quite frankly that the, the department's uh, operation are uh, operating under the, the political direction uh, of the leader of an anti hunting, anti shooting party. Right. Uh, Chair, uh, I'd like to thank the representatives for their submissions here today, and I think they have developed for us, and I would venture to say for the department, PSNA, and all that, the solution. Yep. Now, it's, it's how we, if you like, as a committee, look at this, if you like, assume that there's ownership of it and advance it, is because I've sat here on this committee long <coughs> enough discussing this. Yeah. People out there are frustrated, the people in this committee are frustrated. They really don't want to hear about this again because they want to hear about it as a solution up until now. It's yeah. different. So, Chair, I think the challenge for us is how do we lift this and how do we advance it with the department? Well, look, first thing that we'll do is we'll write to the department with the, these proposals to get comments on them. And we think it's only fair procedurally that we do that. Uh, and then the committee can take a decision what we do as a committee and whether we want to bring forward any sort of proposals ourselves or any amendments to. Any legislation that's there that, that will give us opportunity to do that, but I think procedurally it's the right thing to do. It right to the department first with a copy of these proposals. I know that the gentlemen are going to do that tomorrow anyway. Keep ourselves, or I think we'll do that as a committee, 
and try to get feedback as soon as possible, then we can take a decision. Yep. Based on Chair, just, just for clarity myself, I want to put it to hope I'm working on the presumption that do all members see these as a reasonable solution or compromise on, on what we're working on? I suspect all members don't, given that one of us is not here. Um, so oh, well, no. I, I, wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to make that comment, but look, I, I think it's fair if we, if, we, if we as a committee write to the department with these proposals, get feedback, and then I'm happy to facilitate a discussion amongst the committee to see what we do as a committee on it. I think it would be also yes. fair, Chair, to include in any correspondence with the Department that this matter has dragged on long enough. Yeah. And they, they now have, they have come forward with, with their proposals. Uh, the representative bodies have come back with, with their proposals. There is a difference, but we need to get to a conclusion. And the Committee should be urging the Department to, to arrive at a conclusion on all of these matters and have this matter dispensed with so that people can actually get, get on with, with, with the business. And Chair, one suggestion, if we could have an efficient, quick turnaround response yes. on this, and with clarity on that CFAX issue as well, because... Yes, no, I've noted that as well. Thank you. Fair enough. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank, thank, thank you, you sir. Okay, members, can we move on to uh, agenda item 6, if I refer you to pages 80 through 116 of your meeting folders for the relevant... Yeah. Papers, you'll recall at last week's meeting the committee considered correspondence from the Minister indicating his intention to commence on the 1st of June Articles 19, 20, 26 and 30 of the Criminal Justice Order 2008, which provide for a conditional early release scheme for prisoners, a curfew to be imposed during the early release period, recall to custody in the event of a breach of licence conditions and release on compassionate grounds in exceptional circumstances. We agreed that officials should attend today to outline the proposal and answer members' questions. The committee had previously considered proposals such as this in 2012 and 2013. So, can I invite the officials to take their seats at the table? And can I welcome Alan Smith, Head of Licensing and Legislation in the Prison Service, and Paul Doran, Deputy Director, Probation Board uh, for Northern Ireland. Uh, just to remind you that we're hand sorting the session up here in due course. Uh, and whenever you're ready, if you want to brief the committee, and then we'll open up to questions afterwards. So, in your own time. Okay. Chair, Paul and I are grateful of the opportunity to talk to your committee again about the Department's plans to commence Articles 19, 20, 26 and 30 of the Criminal Justice Northern Ireland Order 2008. As you know, these cover two quite separate aspects, namely a conditional early release scheme for prisoners, together with certain ancillary powers concerning recall and curfews and then a separate power to release prisoners on compassionate grounds in exceptional circumstances. The Justice Minister wrote to you on the 19th of May, setting out his plans in some detail. I don't intend to take you through every last line of that letter, but will instead try to pick up on the salient points. I will also try to cover some of the concerns that were raised the last time officials gave evidence. I am conscious that the Minister covered much of this in an earlier written reply to your then chairman, but I'm, I'm equally conscious that a few of you are coming to this for the first time. I should like to begin by saying something about conditional early release. It is not a particularly new or novel idea. It has been utilised for some time now in other jurisdictions as ideas on how best to rehabilitate and resettle offenders change and develop. Indeed, more extensive early release schemes already exist in Great Britain and in the Republic of Ireland. <coughs> For example, England and Wales, together with Scotland, operate home detention curfew arrangements, while the Irish Prison Service launched a community return scheme in 2011. These schemes see sizeable numbers of prisoners released early from the custodial parts of their sentences. It is an accepted fact that everyone receiving a custodial prison sentence has been found guilty of breaking the law and that they have been punished for that by being deprived of their liberty. However, the Department believes that a small number of prisoners who present a low risk of reoffending and who have been model prisoners during their time in custody should be given the opportunity to be released early under strict licence conditions for rehabilitation and resettlement purposes. In introducing this scheme, the Prison Service and Probation Board hope to demonstrate that we are forward-thinking, progressive organisations uh, that can reward hard work and exemplary behaviour, and in doing so, help some low-risk offenders reintegrate more quickly back into society. However, our scheme is deliberately restrictive because, one, we want to maximise public confidence in it, 
and in the wider criminal justice system, and two, we only want to facilitate the release of the low-risk model prisoner. A number of members previously raised concerns that the Department is being motivated by a drive to reduce prison numbers. That is simply not the case. Article 19 provides the Department with quite a wide-ranging discretionary power to release prisoners early. Although it includes a number of statutory disqualifications, the way it is written means that many prisoners could qualify for early release if we were so minded. To address this issue, we have included a number of tests which have been drawn up to ensure that only those offenders who have demonstrated that they pose a low risk of reoffending, that, that they have been of good behaviour whilst in custody, that they have approved, stable and supportive accommodation in the community, and that they have complied fully with all conditions imposed during any earlier periods of temporary release, would qualify to be considered for early release. To underpin our desire to maximise public confidence in the scheme, we have now further tightened these original qualifying criteria by including a number of offences which will presume that a prisoner is unsuitable for early release. These exclusions follow closely those offences that are already applied in Great Britain on a non-statutory basis and which deem applicants to be presumed unsuitable for home detention curfew. They identify those prisoners who have been convicted of a crime, the serious nature of which makes them unsuitable for consideration for early release, and who, if so released, could undermine public confidence in the scheme and by association in the wider criminal justice system. While these excluded offences will not preclude an individual from applying for CER, that's conditional early release, their existence will deem the applicant unsuitable for release unless they are able to convince the Governor that exceptional circumstances exist that support their release and that such release will not have an adverse effect on public confidence. That said, given the serious nature of the types of offences that will bring an offender into the presumed unsuitable category, it is doubtful that many of them would be deemed as presenting a low risk of reoffending. Deputy Chair Raymond McCartney previously raised some concern about how the scheme would operate. I can confirm that prisoners will have to apply and that applications will be subject to a review against the set criteria. If an applicant meets all the tests, he or she will qualify for conditional early release. When commenced, the power vested in Article 19 of the order will be exercised by the Prison Service on behalf of the Department of Justice. Early release licences will include those standard conditions set out in the Criminal Justice Sentencing Licence Conditions Rules 2009. The licence may also include such other conditions as may be required by the Sentencing Court and such other conditions as the Department deems necessary. The licence will also include a curfew condition provided for under Article 26 of this order that will require a released prisoner to remain at a particular place for a set period of time each day during the early release period. This period cannot be less than nine hours in any one day. Prisoners who fail to comply with licence conditions may be recalled to custody at any time before the custody expiry date is reached. Given the preparatory and assessment work that will be involved in considering an application for CER, a period of up to four weeks from the date the application is received is allowed before the release takes place if that is granted, although every effort will be made to complete within three weeks. In addition, to avoid an early inundation of applications, prisoners will not be able to make an application until eight weeks before their custody expiry date. Um, or their, sorry, the CER date. Articles 26 and 30 of the order will be commenced at the same time as Article 19. They provide for individuals released under Article 19 to be subject to a curfew, as explained earlier, and to recall during the early release period. Just to reiterate, the scheme is for low-risk offenders only, and specifically excludes those guilty of more serious crimes, regardless of risk. It is therefore expected that very few of those released early will have victims registered with the Prison Release <coughs> Victim Information Scheme. However, in the event that they do, the victims will be informed of the pending release, the reasons for it, under normal uh, Prison Release Victim Information Scheme arrangements. Why introduce this now is a legitimate question. The Committee is aware that the Department has been considering the early release of some categories of prisoner for some time now. However, this has required a large number of technical changes to our information management system and in-depth discussions with probation colleagues, our legal advisers and prison-based administrative and operational staff. With all the preparatory work now complete, this period, just before the summer, is the ideal time to launch such a scheme. 
With the courts in recess during much of July and August, the reception and turnover of prisoners is less than during other times of the year. This reduction in normal business will give our establishments time to process the initial number of applications and embed the scheme properly. The scheme will be subject to a review process um, when sufficient outturn data is available. Now, turning then to release on compassionate grounds just very quickly, Article 20 mirrors Article 7 of the Life Sentences Northern Ireland Order 2001, which deals with life sentence prisoners only by providing for the release on compassionate grounds of all other categories of prisoner if the Department is satisfied that exceptional circumstances exist which justify such a release. As with lifers, the qualification bar will be set at a high level. Such releases will only be considered in exceptional circumstances, i.e. where a prisoner is nearing death or where his or her health has deteriorated to such an extent that he or she requires a level of round-the-clock intensive care that is impossible to deliver in a prison environment. We will take advice from our health care partners, the South Eastern Health and Social Care Trust, in these matters. Again, any victims will be informed of the release under the normal prison release victim information scheme arrangements. I hope you find that helpful, and Paul and I are now happy to take questions. Okay, um, I have a few questions just before we open it up to other members. Um, anyone who's been at the, the sort of justice seminars would, would appreciate, I think, that I would certainly be of the view that for the low-level offenders, if we can avoid them going to prison in the first place, that's probably a, a good thing, both from an economic point of view and from a rehabilitation point of view. Although I must say, I have some difficulty with somebody who has been given a sentence that if they don't serve out that entire sentence, I think that's, that's something slightly different. I think that's something which will be difficult to convince the, the public of as well. You mentioned the fact that the motivation, the rationale behind it is not about trying to save money by getting people out of prison or the overcrowding. Uh, I suggest to you that the sceptical among us may think that the fact that there is overcrowding in prisons or there's a lack of prison officers may be part of the motivation behind it. How do you convince us that that's not the case? Well, two ways. The numbers who are going to qualify for this are really quite small. Okay. Um, we're talking about around the 35 mark between now and the end of June, and then the initial bump. And then there's about 50 prisoners who are left in the system thereafter who will qualify, who are in prison now, will qualify for this. Now, others will come on stream as they're sentenced and come into the system. Yeah. Secondly, I would say that, as I said earlier, Article 19, as drafted in the order, gives us quite uh, give, would give the department quite extensive powers to release large numbers of prisoners if it was so minded. We don't want to do that. We don't think it's beneficial. We want to concentrate only on those low-risk prisoners who we think would benefit from getting back into society a little bit earlier. We've had quite a bit of discussion in the last few weeks about the powers that the, the department has. Just in terms of the powers that the department does have in terms of this, what is the role for this committee or the role for the Assembly? Or can the Minister go ahead and do this without anything any formal um, because because this order came into place before devolution, and it's, it's in the statute books since 2008. The department, the minister, can commence order can commence articles of the order as of when he sees fit. But he wants to consult with the committee on it before he's doing that, and, but, but and let me know do what he's doing. Of the committee or the assembly. That is possible. And, and just another issue with, with in recent weeks, we've heard from the, the probation board about how they are highlighting that. They really don't have the, the amount of staff that, that they need to have in order to monitor um, offenders living in the community. If we were to release more uh, <laughs> offenders early into the community, and probation board have already said they maybe don't have the staff or the resources that they require, how can we be confident that, that there will be adequate monitoring of those who have been given early release? You want to take that one? Yes, uh, Chairman. Indeed, we have indeed plenty of financial pressures, but I would emphasise that probably about. 80 to 90 per cent of these people would be coming out on licence to us anyway. So really it's just an earlier commencement of that licence period. And as Alan has stated, they are, they are low risk and we anticipate there will be a relatively low number of them. So uh, we are satisfied that we have the arrangements in place to safely manage them in the community. And in terms of the, the early release you talked about in order to facilitate ability, um, rehabilitation, um, I, again I, I would be supportive of rehabilitation as a, 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 a sentence. Is there even a mechanism that those who are given an early release, rather than just being released and, and uh, there to live their lives, albeit under some sort of uh, curfew, is there a mechanism that they would go into some sort of uh, community sentence where they have to do some sort of uh, some sort of work that pays back their debt to the community in a different way, even if that short period of time? Because it would strike me that in terms of, of transitioning back into the, the general community, that might be a controlled way in which they're doing it. 
and the public might be given reassurance that although they've been released from prison early, they're still pay, repaying their debt to society in a, in a more meaningful way. Yes, may I pick that up again? Um, I, I can confirm that the prisoners who will be subject to licence um, will be eligible to undertake offending uh, of programmes to address offending behaviour. And that can commence earlier, which is... Will they be required to do it, though, is the question? Um, if there is a condition on their licence, yes, they will, be they will be required to do it. But if there's not a condition, because they're still technically prisoners on early release, we can't compel them to undertake a programme. Um, they will be subject to curfew, as, as Alan has said. Um, on the um, undertaking some sort of reparative work, Mr Ross, um, it, our colleagues in the South do have such a scheme. They have legislation there, Alan referred to community return. And I met with colleagues from the South last week. It's a very impressive scheme where, where people get early release and undertake is the community yeah. service. We don't have the legislative authority to do that. It's certainly something that pb and I would be keen to see at some stage in the future, but it's not available at this stage. We did consider that um, whenever we were in this scheme together, but as Paul says, we don't have the authority, we don't have the legal yeah. part to do that. Um, uh, well, so that's something, something, something I'd about. be more comfortable with. I think it's a, it's a better way of, of dealing with it, and if that means that we don't you know, use the, the, the order until we have that in place, maybe that's something which uh, would be useful. Just a couple of final points. In terms of the unsuitable uh, individuals, I take it we are talking about those who are in prison with terrorism charges or violent offences or sexual offences and things like that? Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, just very, very finally. Uh, in terms of the, the, the role for people who are victims of, uh, of violence or, of, sorry, are victims of, of the offences in which those are, are serving prison sentences for, what role is there for, for those people? I mean, in terms of being notified of, of a prisoner who is being given early release or as part of that process, is there, is, Victim, is there a part of the process that the victim, is there for victims? Victim, if there are victims, and my sense in this is because we're dealing with the very low end of, the, of, 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 our, of our prisoners, there will not be very many people well, not really telling, but, but they will have the same rights as any other victim of any other offender. They'll be able to make representations, and those will be taken into account whenever the licence conditions have been drawn up. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sammy? Thank you, Chair. And you've actually asked a couple of questions that I was going to ask. Um, I suppose that uh, one of my concerns is this that um, I've actually spoken to the chair about this this week. There was a, a protest that came to the Stormont here of a young man called um, Neil Dabney who has major pain in his, in his mouth. He's only a few months of a, of a sentence and um, A, they refused to give him any medical treatment, even though the doctor and consultant had, had recommended it, um, but B, his family and others were looking for an early release for him, and, and, and from what I know, he was, he was arrested for maybe um, during the whole flag protest <laughs> as well. The end of the end. Well, how do you square that up you know, with someone like that? Now, I know you, you can't delve into a um, case like that, but um, those situations cause people like me um, major problems that we're going to be releasing others, and there is a genuine case that, that I certainly see. In fact, I gave a letter um, to, to the minister from Nabi's uh, family. Um, I can't talk about individual cases, but he, that somebody, like somebody like that could could qualify for at least under Article 19. Right. If a situation deteriorates and is, and, and is really quite um, exacerbated, Article 20, which I talked about, mm -hmm. compassionate release, is also a possibility for people who the South Eastern Trust reckon um, can't be looked after or need that intensive 24 hour care that they can't provide in a prison environment. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good, good point, Chairman. And something. Um, if that's going to be a case, it's something that I would be very um, keen to support. If it was that, that type of person. Raymond? Uh, just, I, I mean, the concern that, that I raised the last time, and I think you have addressed it, that, I mean, prisoners are, I mean, if you fit the criteria, then you should you should be released. Is mm. that what you're saying? Yes, yes, yeah, you, you have to be on the criteria, yes. It can't I'm be, like, you, you're not. It's quite a high bar. bar. It's quite a high bar to get over. But no, no, I, I've, seen the, I've seen the criteria, and that's fine, but I'm saying it's not some sort of. So we're going to release 10 every month in the no. first twit. No, that, no. That, that was my concern. No, I know that was your concern, yeah. that's why I specifically mentioned it. And, and it's across time. all the prison estate? Yes. Young offenders? Yes. Well, young offenders. Over, over 18s, yeah. Yeah, over 18s, yeah. Uh, in terms of the, the, the Article 20, mm -hmm. I was just reading that, where it said 
currently only a life sentence prisoner can be released. Yes, there's an, there's, a, there's an anomaly or a lacuna yeah. in the law where life sentence prisoners under Article 7 of the Life Sentence Order 2001 can be released on compassionate grounds. We've used it twice since 2001. I think we discussed this the last time. That yeah. This is this is really this is a positive step for the prison service to be able to to allow others, all the other categories of prisoner, if they get to that stage where they're nearing they're nearing death or they, they need 24-hour intensive care that can't be provided in the prison environment, then along with our, our, our healthcare partners, we can take the step to license those people and to release them on, on compassionate grounds. Right. There's no provision now for that. Is, is we, there a way the minister can intervene? Say, if we if we have a if we have a non-lifer who needs yeah. who's not in the position at the minute, he's yeah. released under Rule 27. It's, still it's, remains as a prisoner, though he doesn't have the yeah, you know released, he, okay, he, okay. he doesn't have that release. Okay, and and, and this will this and this will, will, and this, and and this will address that. Okay, thank you. Okay, Edward. <clears throat> um, what's what happens in the case of of the victim of the crime? In that, if a prisoner is, is going to be released at an earlier point than, than anticipated, so say someone who has um, been involved in, in an assault where someone has been actually quite badly hurt, and they anticipate that that person has went to jail, and through the whole process, that person has went to jail, they anticipate that they're in jail and they walk down the street and bump into them. Are, are, are they informed if this person is going to be released at an earlier point? Victims will be informed the way the, the way victims are informed now, but. I was saying earlier that um, because of the high bar we're setting here, the sort of people you're talking about are very unlikely to benefit from this early release scheme. Um, and therefore, I, my, my own sense is that we've got a very few registered victims for the type of people, the low-risk, well-behaved model prisoners that we're talking about. Um, but, but, but if it does happen, um, they'll be informed exactly the same way as they would be at the, at the, the end of the custodial period um, yeah. as a victim. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else that indicated, just again from a personal view on this, you know, I understand these are people who maybe are involved in fraud or, or, or crime such as this. I still think there's a public expectation that they repay their debt to society, and I would perhaps wish to write to the minister about the legislation in the Republic of Ireland whether or not there is an intention to introduce something similar to that would require prisoners, even if they're given early release, and um, I'm comfortable with that if. They're still paying, repaying their debt to society in a more meaningful way, so we might write to the minister if colleagues are, are content with that, just to see about if there's any intention. But thank you for that. That was that was informative and useful. So. Okay. Thanks very much. So we're happy enough. I'll, I'll do that. We'll get a letter off the minister yeah. to investigate that because I think it, it, it would give the public certainly more comfort in terms of this, yeah. and I think it would actually be valuable as well in terms of if we are looking to rehabilitate lower level offenders, it's a sort of stepping stone or stepping way back into normal society. Raymond, I, I mean, this is making the assumption that it will be ruled out, and then without you know getting the, the names of individual people, it might be a bad idea to get the category. Of, of people released and the offence, yeah. and that might then sure. lay that figure. Like, yeah, no, I think it's. Sure, I, I just yes, um, oh, I was in order with, uh, that just came to mind as an example of no. that guy, Nathan Abney. Um, and um, is it possible we could get a report for, from the minister about that? Because um, the information that, that I've seen and, and speaking to family and others, um, that the, the fellow is in tremendous pain. It might, it might be because the committee tends to try to avoid individual cases. I might suggest you do that as an individual MLA and write to the minister to get a report, not just. I think the so committee generally okay, tries to avoid individual cases, individual. but it might be there. Okay. All right. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, members. Move on then to agenda item seven. I can refer you to pages 118 through to 461 of the meeting folder. Just to remind the committee, at the meeting on the 11th of March, the committee agreed that it was content with a proposed statutory rule to provide for revisions to PACE codes A to H to reflect current policing procedures and practices and make formal provision for EU Directive 2010-64 on the right to interpretation and translation in criminal proceedings. The revised codes will, be, will supersede the existing codes and copies of each code are included in the meeting folder. Statutory Rule number 2015-225 was laid by the Department on the 5th of May and is subject to the negative resolution procedure. There have been no changes to the policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the Committee and the Examiner of Statutory Rules has indicated he has no issues to raise with regard to the technical aspects of the rule. So if the Committee is content, then I will put the question formally. 
that the Committee for Justice considered set to rule number 2015-225, the Police and Criminal Evidence Northern Ireland Order 1989, Codes of Practice Order 2015, and there's no objection to the rule. Are we content? Yeah. Agenda item 8, then, can I refer members to pages 462 through to 481 of the meeting folder? Just to remind the committee that the meeting on the 16th of April, the committee agreed that it was content with a proposed statutory rule to provide for the appointment of competent authorities in enforcement in Northern Ireland in relation to explosive substances and mixtures, which is a requirement of EU regulation number 1372-2008 on the classification, labelling and packaging of substances and mixtures. The statutory rule number 2015-236 was laid by the department on the 6th of May and is subject to the negative resolution procedure. There have been no changes to the policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the committee, and the examiner of statutory rules has indicated he has no issues to raise with regard to the technical aspects of the rule. So again, if members are content, I'll put the formal question that the Committee for Justice considered statutory rule number 2015-236, Explosives Appointment of Authorities and Enforcement Regulations Northern Ireland 2015, and has no objection to the rule. Are we content? Yeah. Okay, agenda item 9 then, can I refer members to pages 483 through to 490 of the pack. Just to remind the committee, on the 23rd of April, the committee agreed that it was content with a proposed statutory rule to amend the Crown Court Rules in Northern Ireland 1979 to provide for new court procedures in light of amendments to the Proceeds of Crime Act 2002, introduced by the Serious Crime Act 2015. The new court procedures for which updated rules are necessary relate to applications for a compliance order, a new provision allowing the making of an order by the court with the purpose of ensuring that the criminal confiscation order is effective, and applications for discharge or variation of a confiscation or compliance order. Such a rule number 2015-241 was laid by the Department on the 11th of May and is subject to the negative resolution procedure. There have been no changes to the policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the committee, and the examiner of statutory rules has indicated that he has no issues to raise with regard to the technical aspects of the rule. So again, if members are, are content, I'll put the question formally that the Committee for Justice considered statutory rule number 2015-241, the Crown Court Amendment Rules, Northern Ireland 2015, and has no objection to the rule. Are content? Agenda item 10, then, can I refer you to pages 492 through to 506 of the meeting folder? Schedule 2 of the Criminal Justice Act, Northern Ireland 2013, makes provision for a new framework uh, for retention and destruction of DNA and fingerprints taken from persons in connection with the investigation of the offence under the Police and Criminal Evidence, Northern Ireland Order 1989. Pace. This will replace the existing blanket and indefinite nature of the current law with one that differentiates between the age of the offender, the seriousness of the offence and whether the person has been convicted or not convicted. A complex programme of work has been undertaken by the PSNI and Forensic Science Northern Ireland in readiness for commencement of the new framework which the Department anticipates will be brought into operation on the 31st of October 2015. The Department needs to make three orders in readiness for implementation of the new biometric retention framework and at the meeting on the 12th of May, the committee noted the results of a consultation on, on revisions to PACE Code D, uh, the Transitional and Saving Provisions Order and the Qualifying Offences Amendment Order. The Department has now provided details of the three proposed statutory rules that will be subject to the negative resolution procedure. The Criminal Justice Act, Northern Ireland 2013, Destruction, Retention and Use of Biometrical uh, Data. A transitional and savings provisions order 2015 will primarily make provision for the destruction or retention of biometric material taken before those provisions came into force, i.e. legacy material. The Police and Criminal uh, Evidence Order 1989 Amendment Qualifying Offences Order will add additional offences to the original list for qualifying offences. These are serious, violent, sexual or terrorism offences and in certain circumstances attract extended biometric retention periods other uh, recordable uh, offences than other recordable offences. The Police and Criminal Evidence Order 1989, Code of Practice Revision of Code D Order 2015, will bring into operation revisions to PACE Code of Practice D in two areas to cover additional powers that will enable the police to take DNA and fingerprints in a wider range of circumstances, including public protection grounds, and for those convicted outside of Northern Ireland of serious, violent or sexual offences, and to replace existing Annex F of the Code with one that reflects new biometric retention framework. So again, just to ask the committee we content uh, with three proposed statutory rules, uh, or does anyone require any further additional uh, uh, information? Is the officials are due to give a briefing? No, or we, no. They've provided the written briefing papers, but we can arrange an oral briefing if you want. If it was appropriate, yeah. 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 Happy enough. Do that. Yeah.
Four, okay. Agenda item 11 then, uh, refer pages to 508 through to 569 of the meeting pack. The department has provided the final progress report against the Northern Ireland Human Trafficking and Exploitation, uh, Exploitation Action Plan for 2014-15. The report includes an appendix providing a cross-border analysis of human trafficking during 2013 and 14, which shows that 176 potential or suspected victims of human trafficking were recorded in both Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic uh, during 2013 and 14. A breakdown by exploitation type, age, gender and country of origin is also provided. That's just really for noting unless anyone has any further information required. Uh, agenda item 12 then can refer to pages 571 through 574. The department needs to make a technical amendment to the Police and Criminal Evidence Application of Police Ombudsman Order 2009, which provides the powers needed by uh, OPONI to carry out its investigatory function. The amendment is required as part of the implementation of the new biometric retention framework to ensure that DNA samples, DNA profiles and fingerprints obtained by them during investigations are obtained and destroyed in accordance with new PACE retention rules. It does not confer any additional powers uh, to the office investigators. Uh, due to the consequential nature of the amendment, the Department intends to carry out a targeted eight-week consultation on the order uh, with the main placing stakeholders and will provide the results of the consultation in due course. So it's really just to note um, the targeted consultation uh, on that, unless anyone requires any additional information. Then item 13, then we move on to correspondence. There's 10 items of correspondence at pages 576 uh, through to 637 in the meeting folder, and one item at page 3 and 4 of the table pack. Uh, I'll draw attention to a couple of those items, and then uh, if anyone has any other issues, they, they can raise them. Item 3 at page uh, 582 is a response from the Department in relation to the level of bereavement damages and the need to consult on the issue. And the Department has outlined that whilst there is no statutory obligation to consult in the matter, it is under a duty to act fairly and consult those who may be impacted by an increase in, the dam in these damages. In its view, a consultation may assist in formulating future policy for the proposed rates of any increase. It now intends to reprioritise the issue and is proposing to bring forward a public consultation for the committee's consideration as soon as possible after the summer recess. And that's something that Patsy and Paul had raised previously. So, uh, if we're happy then uh, to send a, a copy of the department's response to the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers. Who had raised this issue with the committee previously, uh, and also to the Committee of Finance and Personnel, as it has a, an interest in the matter as well. Happy enough to do that. Yep. Yep. I am six then at page 622. Is your response for the department providing further information on the complete <coughs> community safety training college and the revised training needs assessment by the three services following the oral briefing that we received on the 23rd of April. The response provides a breakdown of the reduced requirement in training across the three services to be delivered by the college and the reasons for this. So again. This is uh, to be noted, and Raymond had, had requested that uh, information previously. So, uh, Item 7, then, page 627, is correspondence from the Probation Board, uh, inviting the committee to hold a meeting on its premises and to meet uh, with service users to hear their experience of the criminal justice system uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, if, if members are content, we will schedule a meeting uh, at the Probation Service before the end of the mandate. We have a number of these requests in now, but we'll do our best to do that. Item 8, pages 628, correspondence to the National Federation of Retail News Agents, uh, following, uh, providing a briefing paper on retail crime following the committee's recent business crime event. I think they'd read about uh, that event and uh, give us that uh, information. So again, if members are content, what we could do is include that briefing paper as an appendix to the committee's summary of the business crime event. I think it's a sensible way of doing it. Yep. Happy enough. Item 10. 637 is an invitation to a seminar arranged by Politics Plus in conjunction with the Northern Human Rights Commission on the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, that is at 12.30 p.m. on the 9th of June in the Members' Dining Room. Uh, I would raised this during the Ad Hoc Committee of the Mental Capacity Bill. It is particularly relevant, I think, to members who are, are sitting in that Ad Hoc Committee, but uh, may also be relevant to, to members of this committee as well. So if anyone wants to go to that 9th of June, 12.30, uh, maybe advise the committee office uh, that you'll attend that okay. seminar. Okay, so thank you. Um, item one then of the table pack is a letter from the department regarding the transfer of learning and skills provision in the prisons. The transfer of learning and skills provision in the prisons to, Metropol to Belfast Metropolitan College and North West Regional College, which is a core part of the reform of prisons, was announced today at an event in Hyde Bank Wood. Uh, so again, that's just for noting. Have any members seen any other comments and correspondence? Okay, uh, Chairman's business then, just to uh, make the committee aware of accepting the invitation 
I'm the Minister to attend the opening of an innovative project on Lisburn Road on Wednesday the 3rd of June to support young parents who have offended to change their lives and improve the life outcomes of their children. I think that's in the morning of, of uh, the 3rd of June that I'm going to. Uh, agenda item 15 is any other business, other than wishing Edmund a happy birthday. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, no other. Uh, these are all big, they're, they're all big birthdays. Yeah, 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 yeah. Every one you know, from here on. Yeah. <laughs> Raymond, sorry, yes. Uh, uh, just a, a brief point. The, the, uh, the department tabled a number of amendments for this justice problem. They yeah. seem to be, you know, just, you know, in the future, just if they were doing that, they give us notice and perhaps the rationale, because like, now, it's 20 odd pages and they could amount to nothing, no in terms of just they're consequential, but it's just, yes. we we'll have to go through all the you know, stage for yeah. different members and parties, then though they have to... I think it's fair point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> members, um, agenda item 16, then, date, time and place of the next meeting. It'll be on Thursday the 4th of June at 2pm in room 30. So, thank you very much, members. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.